it's now four six, so you may begin. We have already seventy people watching, so okay, bye bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. So it's time for our very exciting tea time chats with three um, fantastic uh, veterinary professionals and veterinary nurse, um, all of who are also um, breeders of golden retrievers, and we thought that this would be an absolutely uh, fascinating um, seminar to put on um, with a variety of aspects about um, choosing sires, using um, estimated breeding uh, variants and, um, and also looking at sorts of common problems that you may experience when you breed golden retrievers. So thanks very much. And um, we can start off by asking um, our panel to introduce themselves and tell us about their lives in Golden Retrievers and their professional background. So over to Fiona, who most of the UK exhibitors will know very well with her beautiful bitches. Thank you. Thank you, um, Penny. Um, well, as I said yesterday, I do feel a bit of a fraud being on this panel. I'm sure there are probably more scientific people to invite. So I'm here to sort of give um, the practical side of things um, and just add in a, a, a different viewpoint maybe. Yeah. Um, I also intend to pick the other two's brains <laughs> as much as anybody else is going to afterwards. Um, so I qualified as a veterinary nurse in Ireland in 1982. That makes me a, an RVNosaurus. And um, I spent most of my professional career working in um, animal welfare. I did spend some time in um, private practice, but I found I really enjoyed working with rescue dogs. And it was there that I um, developed a particular interest in, in uh, behavior. Um, and that continues to this day. Um, I do miss hands-on veterinary nursing, which is why I have maintained my registration. I do CPD and what have you, because a little bit of me thinks, well, maybe I might do a little bit of locuming now that I've left full-time employment. Um, and I was in the process of setting that up when, of course, COVID happened last year. So instead, I've spent the year playing with my dogs who are very happy to have me full time. <laughs> um, I've had Goldens since 1976. And um, but there was a big hiatus in the 1980s when I came to England first. For, I spent 20 years in England before coming to Scotland. Um, and during, the, uh, during that period, I was concentrating on my career. But I still had Goldens, but none good enough to show, really. Um, and if they're not good enough to show, they're not good enough to breed from. Um, so that's me. <laughs> oh, that looks fantastic. Thanks very much. And you're not a fraud. You, you bring with you a wealth of knowledge. And as a successful breeder, as well as a veterinary nurse, I, I think you're going to have lots to add to our chat today. So, And um, our next... Um, panelist is Anne Taggett, who's um, a vet, and I've sat with Anne on the Breed Council for many years. So over to you, Anne. Okay, well, I'm a qualified veterinary surgeon. I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 1975, and after taking three months to go around the world on a round the world ticket, I started in small animal practice later in 75, and worked in small animal practice full time for 10 years. I then uh, started running boarding kennels, which I did for another 10 years and just worked part time. And when we eventually sold the kennels, I went back to part time work um, and retired about three years ago, except that I seem to be called in to do locum work occasionally. And I'm also the veterinary inspector for my local council for people who apply for a breeding license. I've had golden retrievers since 1975. I didn't really get into showing until about 1990, although I did have a few litters before then, um, but I really, my interest was, um, became a lot stronger in, the, in 1990. Uh, I don't show to a very high level, but I have got seven stubble numbers and a couple of junior warrants that I've produced. So. Um, I'm there or thereabouts, but my main emphasis is on breeding healthy dogs that will make good pets. So I put 
temperament and health, top of the list, and show potential, third. <laughs> oh, that sounds very sensible, Anne. <laughs> Thank you for that. And then we have Nathalie, who is um, our vet from Belgium, and um, she is uh, also a um, specialist in reproductive health, and I'm sure she's going to contribute very greatly to our talk today. So over to you, Natalie. Hi. Th thank you, Penny. Um, I'm Natalie. I'm from Belgium. I started in Golden Retrievers in 91 as a child. Our first Golden came into our family. Um, in 94, I had my first show Golden that my parents bought for me. And there, everything started with it. I was uh, 14 years old and went to shows. It went very nicely, so we started breeding. And my profession is a result of uh, the passion I have for the Goldens. So I went to veterinary school while in the meantime, I had a very nice bitch angel, which I showed and I could convince my parents to bring me to Luxembourg and to Dortmund. That was the most far point my parents wanted to bring me. <laughs> <laughs> So in 2004, I was graduating as a veterinary and I just started my own clinic right away. Um, then I studied more and more in, I did the veterinary European school for uh, animal surgery. So um, yeah, surgery, orthopedics. And then I found my true love fertility that was what was the best mix of both worlds for me. So we continued um, to make our practice of specialized in fertility and we made fertility vets. And in the meanwhile, we had some great dogs who joined the club while, and me going around Europe, as you all know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, and these are some of your lovely photographs with all your brood. You obviously do some working as well. Yes, I love working in Golden Retriever, who was both in the show rings and on the fields. And I'm a yeah. proud owner of some of uh, my dogs who went field proud champion. On this picture, you also see my world champion from the most... Uh, from out of working class, which made me more proud than all, than everything. Was that, that him? Yeah. No, the other one, the, the other one. Yes, this is Kiss. She's uh, became world champion in 2018. And yeah. she stood in working class. So that made me double proud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a lot to be proud of. And there's your, your son with one of your puppies as well. Yes, this is my son, Hedmas. Ah, yeah. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you. So um, one of the things that um, I thought was very important to discuss was about actual health, because quite often within the breed, um, people think if they've passed all their health checks that they have a healthy dog. But I really like this um, World, World Health Organization definition of health. I think it says an awful lot that health is a state of complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity and I think that might help people to think a little bit more widely about um, how they actually select their dogs but um, you know as as veterinary professionals what was your definition of a healthy golden retriever do you want to start, Fiona? Um, well, I do think that that's a really good definition. Um, but I would also um, add in perhaps um, emotional well-being because we go on about temperament. And I do feel that temperament is um, partly inherited, but I think it's also partly acquired. And I think how we keep our dogs is very important to ma maintain um, emotional uh, contentment. Um, you look at some of the some of the successful breeders that I admire and you will see if you follow them on Facebook that they've constantly got them out doing things with them, allowing them to be dogs, um, mm. allowing them to use their noses, which is I think the single best thing we can do for our dogs. And um, those dogs are 
very happy and healthy. And I think that's important. Mm. Um, it's enrichment of life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 That creates that emotional. And as, as, as well as that, um, in addition to the tests that the kennel club or the breed clubs require, I think we do need to go a little bit further because we have got some diseases in the breed that um, we need to be aware of and keep an eye out for. Um, and although there isn't an official scheme for Goldens, I do feel that heart, checking hearts is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to see that become official for our breed. Um, you can live with um, a fold in your eye, but you can't really live with a dodgy heart for very long. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fiona. Anne, is there anything you would add to the definition? Well, like Fiona, I think this is quite a good definition, but I do think that the um, emotional well-being of our dogs is vital. Mm. Um, I have to say that although I have missed the shows, I think the dogs have really enjoyed the fact that all through the last summer we used to go up to the river as four or five times a week they run free in the woods they sniff out fox poo and roll in it they eat horse muck they do all the things that golden retrievers like doing um and i don't think they really missed the showing at all <laughs> oh no i think yes we've missed it more than they have in, in many cases yes i think i think we've missed the social side of the showing but the dogs have had a lot more freedom because certainly if I've got a dog ready for a show and all bathed and beautiful, beautiful, it only gets a short lead walk on dry pavements. Yes. I don't want to risk having to go back to square one and start again. So um, I do think that that's, uh, it, it is important that our dogs, even if they are show dogs, are also allowed to be dogs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Natalie. I agree. We need to keep them as a dog and not like a, a posture or something. And I think we need to have happy dogs, healthy dogs, but we need also great characters. It is a friendly dog. It's a family dog. And we have to keep that in mind that we should not only breed the tests, but also breed the dog, mm. a really happy, friendly dog. Yeah, yeah. I, I think to me, temperament and personality and, uh, you know, that kind of emotional contentment that you see in a really good golden is probably where I would start with my breeding plans. Mm. You know, that to me is the first thing that I really look at and base a lot of the decisions about breeding on, on that side of it, you know. But uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, guys. So... Our next question is, um, different countries have different breeding models, so there'd be different restrictions um, to about around the dogs that you can um, select for breeding. And um, it, I just thought it would be interesting to discuss about different strategies that countries have taken to improve health of dogs and the rules and restriction that exists um, for you to be able to uh, register a litter. And also to discuss if there are any strategies that other countries use that you're aware of that you would sort of hold up as a gold standard for the principles of breeding. Do you want to start, Natalie? Because this is, this is your slide from uh, your area in Belgium, isn't it? Yes, thank you. Here in Belgium, um, the Golden Retriever is on the list of the 21 most famous uh, dogs. So the Flemish Commission made a rule that we all have to obey, that every Golden Retriever has to be tested uh, on eyes, hip dysplasia, uh, elbow dysplasia, and there is here a list you can see that we need to do if we are not um, having clear dogs on those uh, points, then we can breed. But if there is a law case with a puppy buyer who has like a dog with bad hips, then we are totally responsible to pay him all the costs he goes through in that uh, life of that dog. So it's some kind of protection of the buyer but it's also uh, pushing us to go for the clear dogs and to make it uh, better, which is good, but which is also not complete. I agree with Fiona just telling how important it becomes to also check hearts. Um, and that is not in any of those um, 
things in Belgium, we are obliged to make uh, chipping the dogs and knowing who are the parents. That is uh, something we are obliged to. Our kennel club only uses that and hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia. But I think there are some things more we can do, but the more tests you create, the more restrictions you give to breeders. Mm. So, and uh, like I say also for the hearts, in some countries it's just checking for a murmur and in other countries like here, they shave the dog totally, his chest to know for EKG and um, ultrasound. And I don't see a show dog being shaved mm. No. the ring <laughs> no. No. I, I'm, I'm interested on your slide you you've got an area here I take it that's epilepsy yes yes I'm oh. truly embarrassed that in Belgium they think they can test for epilepsy because okay, as, a, yeah. as a vet we really had some uh, discussions with those commissions because we as a vet need to sign a paper to to sign that the dog does not have epilepsy and i don't want to uh, sign that because every person who comes in my clinic with an epileptic dog i've never seen it in seizures yeah. so if a breeder comes here he can say whatever he wants mm. so mm. i'm not agreeing that a vet should sign there that this dog doesn't have any epileptic seizures yeah yeah okay um, yeah, I know it's an interesting, it is an interesting point. I was wondering if you were all having to have EKGs or whatever they're called on your docs. We regard epilepsy, idiopathic epilepsy, as a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, yeah. We say there is no test for idiopathic, in other words, inherited epilepsy. Yeah. Um, it's only there is none. It's only when we've done all the blood tests to rule out metabolic diseases, we've done the MRI to rule out um, lesions in the and brain. And if, mm -hmm. if we find nothing and the dog's still having fits, then we say it must be idiopathic epilepsy. So there yeah. is absolutely no way that you can certify no. that the dog is clear because the picture is going to be exactly the same in a clear dog as it is in an epileptic dog. Yes, yeah. that's what we mean. Yeah, you actually ruled out everything else therefore it has to be the apathic epilepsy but you yeah. could do the same thing to a healthy dog without epilepsy and get the same results yes it's yeah crazy. yeah i know it, it's a it's a really difficult one isn't it because epilepsy can be as you say a symptom of, of so many other illnesses well, seizures can be a symptom yeah. of so many other things yeah but it's also very harsh to blame the breeder for a dog that's got bad hips because even the most pessimistic um, orthopedic person says that hip dysplasia is only 40% inherited. And some people quote figures as low as 15% inherited. Yes. So 60% of it is to do with the way that the owners bring up the puppy. That's why the breeder is so unhappy with these uh, yeah. obligations they put us. Because actually I have had some clients who breed other breeds and they really had to pay over 20,000 euros expenses to have put new hips, total hip replacements on a dog mm -hmm. because of this law. Mm -hmm. So watch out what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Anne, have you any, anything else to add? You we're coming in with the... Yes, um, I think that we, we don't have any rules about what must be tested for before we breed unless we're members of the assured breeder service and you can voluntarily join and you can opt out so it's only if you choose to be in the abs that you have to have the hips the elbows the eyes and the dna tests for pra one and two done um, and i'm not in favor of legislating about numbers so I, I would not like to see a law come in that says you cannot breed from anything with a hip score over 20. No. Or, no. or you could only breed from a zero elbow. I think there are lots of arguments for looking at the whole dog. They're just not a pair of hips or a pair of elbows. No, no. I mean, I, I think I've got some sort of personal parameters of where I probably wouldn't breed from, you know. Um, 
I think nowadays it would be difficult to breed from a bitch with probably hips above, you know, maybe in the high 20s or above, um, just because of the, you know, the, the fact that people are using that now as, a, as part of a judgment about, um, even though there isn't any proof that the puppies will be affected, you know, you, you, you can be in a difficult situation, can't you? So I, I think I've got some personal standards about what I would and wouldn't do. But uh, I think, yeah, I agree with you. Some countries have got very firm restrictions where if your dog's got a, a D hip or something, you're not able to breed. Um, I'm perfectly in favour of them legislating and saying you can't breed from anything unless it's been hip Tested. and elbow scored. Yeah. But I don't want to see legislation saying this is the cutoff. Yeah. I'd like us mm -hmm. to have the information and be allowed to choose what we do with that information. Yeah. Well, well, we are not allowed to choose because when we have a D hip, it's a no go. No go. Yeah. 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 So, thank you, Fiona. Yeah, I'm very much in agreement with um, what, what the others have said. Um, even though this talk is is entitled "The Science of Dog Breeding," I do think that it's half science and half art. Um, I do not want to see the Kennel Club making my breeding decisions for me. I do wish that they would make it mandatory for anyone registering a puppy to have done the tests, but then leave it to the breeder and to, um, to make the decision whether to breed and leave it to the puppy buyer to decide whether they want to buy from that bitch mm -hmm. or dog. Um, I, like you, Penny, I have sort of cut off points in my head yeah, and they're probably in inverse proportion to how good I think that dog is, and what I think its other attributes are, because mm -hmm. it's it's um, it's the it's the whole picture you consider, isn't it? So yeah. you might go slightly higher on a hip score if the dog has got everything else you want, and you've got a suitable mate for it that possibly could bring down that hip score a little. Mm -hmm. um, I think every mating we do, there's a certain element of chance in it anyway, and I think with hips. Um, I have I have mated from high hips, yes. uh, one from an Irish champion, and five generations on that doesn't seem to have reared its head again, mm -hmm. and one from my first UK champion who didn't produce any bad hips in her litter, um, but in the next generation it is it, sort of a yo-yo effect. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it skips the generation. Um, and goes up and down. So um, I'm always extremely careful um, because I did keep her daughter. I'm always careful sort of going down through those lines where I go with them. Um, but yeah, I don't think that there should be, it shouldn't be prescribed by the mm -hmm. Kennel Club, um, but they need to stop these people from breeding without testing. Because at least if you test, you can make informed choices and the buyers can make informed choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is interesting, though, isn't it, that there's only, in, in, certainly in the UK, probably the, the vast majority of dog breeding occurs outside of the pedigree dog world. So, um, you know, we, we're sort of seeing all these Labradoodles, Cockapoos and things coming through and, and neither side are health checking, um, where there is potential from both sides to bring different genetic diseases to the pool, you know. Um, and they have, they have to be yeah. diseases. They have bad hips, they have bad elbows. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. I so involved in a discussion with somebody who had a puppy that bled out at seven months and she tested all her stock for von Willebrands. And in fact, she has not only tested all the litter mates, she's tested the parents and all the grandparents. And, but there is no genetic test for von Willebrands in Goldens. And I looked it up to check. And you can check Golden Doodles and you can check Labradoodles for von Willebrands disease, but you cannot test Golden Retrievers. All right, range. The test is not available for that particular breed. Mm -hmm. The DNA test I'm talking about. Okay, that might be an interesting sort of project um, for, for somebody to have a look and see if there's any, any relevance to the Golden. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I, I had my, um, my last bitch done by a company called My Dog DNA, and they run through a, a, a wide variety of genetic tests. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite interesting what they, what, what's included in that, you know. Um, well, I used a dog that had had one of those huge packages, yeah. um, a Dutch dog, and um, he'd been tested for things that I had never heard of in, That's in, right. heard in Goldens. And he said, no, they don't, but it's just the package that you get 30 yeah. tests for your That's 100 right. euros or whatever. Yeah. And do you not find it's the it's the um, commercial breeders in this country that go for those packages because it impresses the, the, the buyer that doesn't know how I'll put my hand up and say I just sent off swabs for my <laughs> six month old and I chose the package because it was actually cheaper. Yeah, that's why I did the three tests I wanted done. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I got I got everything I wanted and more. Which yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah. I, I saw no harm in testing for PRCD and um, muscular dystrophy as well, which was included in the package, um, because it, as I say, it worked out cheaper than doing the three tests that I wanted to do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, the labs uh, von Haring and and uh, Laboklin use those panels. And yeah. they say it's it's cheaper for them also to run a panel than do just ECT, just PRA1. So we all choose the packages now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it is. And it does provide some additional information, I think, if nothing else, monitoring the breed and yeah. showing what, yeah. what may be going on, which, which I think, you know, is potentially good. So... Um, we, we've kind of touched on this already just through the discussion. Do you think that breeders overestimate the importance of obtaining health certificates and ignore the most important things around overall health like temperament? And do you want to start? I don't think that any of us that take this seriously ignore temperament. Mm -hmm. I would say that all serious golden retriever people, including all the show people, um, would put temperament number one because if you've got a nervous or aggressive golden retriever you can't show it mm -hmm. I mean that, that, you know the people that are just doing it for the showing but for everybody else it's um, just involved in the bettering and the continuance of the breed to the standard temperament's got to be number one yeah, yeah it's lovely to have all the health test results uh, but unless you're built breeding a dog that's lovely and calm and will live as a happily as a family pet mm -hmm. um then well, I don't know what you're doing wasting your time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, but I do think the health tests are important. Yeah. But yeah. I think you have to say, okay, this bitch is good enough to breed from. It's got the most fabulous temperament. Now I'll do the health tests. And if they're okay, then I'll think about having a litter. Yeah. I don't think I'll do the health tests and I'll ignore the fact that she um, curls her lip when you try and take a bone away from her or uh, she's terrified of gunfire or uh, whatever else the issues are. Um, I think if you've got a dog like that, then you don't bother with the health test because you're not going to breed from her. No, 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 absolutely. Fiona? Um, yes, I mean, I don't think anyone who's a breed enthusiast um, is going to ignore temperament because even if you're breeding for the show ring or for working or whatever, um, the majority of every litter is going to end up in a pet home. Um, and so temperament has got to be paramount. Mm. Um, however, as I did say earlier, um, I firmly believe that temperament is um, acquired as well as inherited. It's a it's a mixed thing. Yeah. Um, and I would also look at perhaps why the dog is behaving the way it is. I mentioned to you yesterday that um, the mother of my champion can't be shown because she would be she's she's lovely at home and she'll greet people and whatever soon as I arrive at a show, she just goes to pieces. So I've, I've only ever once attempted to show her. Um, and she, she slinks around the ring like a collie with her tail between her legs. It's just not worth it. She went to ring craft as a puppy and what have you, but I blame the fact that I kept a dog puppy at the same time. I did what I don't allow my buyers to do, have two puppies because when you have two puppies, two siblings together, you do have to put in the extra work to socialize them individually. And I didn't because I worked full time and it was easier to take the two of them out together. They spent all their time with one another and um, he didn't make size. So I rehomed him 
and I think it left her like a a ship without a sail. She she was lost without him, even though I have other dogs. So um, I think consequently, her behaviour is acquired. It's 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 not her inherent temperament, and she certainly hasn't produced anything like it. No, no, no. It's there is also quite a lot of science to back up the fact that the way the bitch is during the pregnancy has a huge influence on the way the puppies are. Yeah. If the bitch is in a loving, affectionate home without any stresses throughout the pregnancy, the puppies will have the same sort of temperament. Mm -hmm. If, I mean, if, God forbid, you moved house or you sent the bitch away for two weeks in kennels while you went on holiday or um, there was you know, some other issue or you stuck the... The, the sort of showbread golden into a kennel for the rest of the for the whole of the pregnancy and didn't interact with it you're much more likely to have problems in the temperament of the puppies than you are if the bitch is living in the house and sleeping on the sofa every night while you watch tv okay that's interesting Anne. well it's to do with the cortisol levels presumably yeah. Yeah. yeah and if you've got high cortisone levels in the bitch and then it um, translates into the puppies and you can get aggression from cortisone so I know, I know in the past, people often used to import or export bitches in well. Mm -hmm. So that was probably not the smartest thing. I've, I've dealt with those in, um, in quarantine. But the good thing about that yeah. was they did allow the puppies out of quarantine two weeks after they were weaned. So when yeah. we had puppies coming into quarantine, we used to wean them young, like five weeks. I mean, we'd start earlier, but we'd just cut off the bitch at five weeks. The puppies would leave at seven weeks. So the importer had time at home with the puppies before they were sold. Yeah. Um, and enabled them to at least put some socialising into the puppies. Yeah. And I have to say, the staff in the kennels used to spend a lot of time with the puppies because the puppies were cute and it was much nicer to spend time with them than, you know, some yeah. dogs at the Air Force and in introduced and only spoke German and tried to take your arm off if you went into the kennel with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Natalie, have you anything to add? Well, I agree, a golden retriever, whatever you want to do, if you want to go show, if you want to go hunting with it, or it's just a family dog, his temperament is the most important thing. You need a healthy dog that the client is not always uh, at the veterinary practice, but you also need a, a dog who is nice to have around. Yeah. And what um, I see a lot in practice in my clinic is I'm so used to having goldens who are nice and that you can do whatever you want with it. When I put one of my own dogs to take progesterone, I just say, sit down, stay, and I take blood alone. And we get bitten a lot in practice by yeah. goldens because yeah. we don't expect them to be yeah. aggressive. And most of them are cases who are afraid so I think that education of dogs and owners is probably something we should do because too many people buy a golden retriever and think, oh, it's the most easygoing dog and it's always friendly. No, they have to train it also. So that's what Fiona says. You need to yeah. do both. Have a good genetics and then also a good foundation mm -hmm. training. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I am going to talk at the end a little bit about the puppy rearing and how important that is from three days of age onwards, because that also really influences the way the puppies behave. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did observe was when we first started doing the hip scoring scheme was that a lot of breeders did go for dogs with very, very low stud dogs with very low hip scores. And I, I actually think it, in that, in the, the early 80s, when they made the decisions around mating, you know, dogs with hips of, you know, two, two or naught, naught, that they actually made some very poor decisions about breeding for temperament. And I, I actually feel that during the, the sort of later part of the 80s, that we did have some behavioral, pro real behavioral problems in the breed. I would have said from the, the, the mid 70s onwards, because I remember oh, okay. yeah. difficult goldens um, from when I was in my first job between 75 and 80, um, mm. one of which we couldn't examine unless we muzzled it. Yes, yeah. So, so there the definitely not, was. Not a typical golden temperament at all. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I wasn't showing goldens in the 70s, so, but from the age. No, I'm talking about in the clinic situation. 
Yeah, yeah. But I, I could definitely see a, a trend in that. And I think that people are nowadays making some better balanced decisions mm -hmm. about breeding. But it is becoming slightly more complicated the more tests that we have mm -hmm. um, because you're trying to juggle more, more things, if you like. So, but thank you for that. So in cl clinical practice, do you feel that health testing has created healthier dogs? Um, and i.e. are the pedigree dogs less affected by certain disease than those coming from populations of dogs that aren't tested? Natalie? No, I don't feel it's uh, so much improved. Like hip dysplasia, they are testing it for years now, and actually they went no step ahead until now. Mm. For ichthyosis, yes, there is a test, and if it's clear, it's clear. So you see lots of breeders trying to get one step further, but then I think they go sometimes too fast. They rule out so many beautiful, well-temperamented dogs just because of the ichthyosis they rule out. So genetic diversification, no. Uh, they go way too narrow because a few years ago, we only had a few stud dogs clear and everybody went to those stud dogs. Mm. Um, and I do see uh, cruciate ligaments, ruptured cruciate ligaments mm. in either uh, uh, golden retrievers, purebreds or non-purebreds. So mm. I don't see a difference there. Yeah. And you see cancer in whether they're um, showbred or just somebody yeah. down the road mated their golden retriever. That's not yeah. making a difference either. And, and we see an awful lot of atopic dermatitis in golden yes yeah but not only in goldens i see it in all the oh, breeds no, it's, it's in all breeds but it's just if if i see a golden it's yeah. likely to have bad ears which is quite often a part of the allergy yeah. or it can have generalized atopic dermatitis um <laughs> or it can have a little skin lump which yeah. normally turns out to be a mast cell tumor yeah yeah. I do think we need a test for atopy. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. That would be uh, number one uh, health test that could be helping every breeder of yeah. every breed. They actually did a study because I was involved about, or oh, must be about 15 years ago now, collecting blood samples from Labradors and Goldens that had no ear history of ear or skin disease. Mm -hmm. um, from practice because they, the, the dermatologists were collecting the samples from the affected dogs in the clinic um, and there was a 12 center study it was it was all over Europe and uh, North America but I never heard that they got any results with it mm. yeah, it's a shame yeah yeah it is isn't it it's um but it, it is interesting I think the other thing that we do is that with say hip dysplasia because it's so polygenetic in a yeah. way we need to be looking and interrogating the statistics a lot more than we have done so we collect a lot they've collected a lot of data but there doesn't seem to be anybody actually now looking at say if dogs are, are hip improvers or what fact other factors may be playing into that. We miss Dr. Willis for that, don't we? Yeah, definitely. Cor Cornell University in the States did identify, I think it was three genes in labs that had some connection to formation of hip dysplasia. Um, they were to do with the formation of collagen and the development of the bone around the the socket and the strength of the teres ligament or something i can't remember but it was it's such a multifactorial disease mm. that it because it's not actually caused by a misshapen hip socket puppies are born with normal hip sockets it's the the genes that are relate to the laxity of the joint it's the looseness of the joint that causes the hip dysplasia that causes the micro fractures at the edge of the acetabulum the, the socket of the, yeah. the hip joint um, <laughs> And that that is what causes the the changes that cause the pain. Yeah. So you actually you need to start from birth and have the puppies on surfaces that they can get a grip on. They shouldn't be sliding about on wet floors, for example. Um, 
and because the damage can start as young as two weeks. Yeah, well, that's very interesting, Anne. Yeah. yeah. So as I say, it's, it's the figures I found for the inheritance of um, hip dysplasia, depending on which authority you go to, were 15, 26, 30, and 40%. 40% is still less than half of the picture. Yeah. It, it is an interesting sort of thing because we put our dogs through quite a few x-rays and that wouldn't be, we wouldn't be allowed to do that with humans because we would have to justify a clinical reason for taking x-rays. And if we've been doing them for all these years, but we're not really making any progress with the scores, um, and improving the sort of breed averages. It's... Well, the breed average was 19 when I came into the breed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now 12.7. Oh, is it I mean. as low as that? Okay. But is yeah, that because but... people don't send off bad plates? Over the last five years, the breed mean is 12.7 and the median, in other words, the midpoint. So half the dogs are below 10 and the other half are above 10. Now the mean is always going to be higher because you're going to have those odd 65, 80, 90 scores in there, which is going to put the average up. Mm -hmm. So, but definitely when I started, it was 19. Gosh. So yeah, we have but... Which is probably why I wouldn't chuck out a very nice bitch with a 20 hip score, because I'm so used to thinking, oh, well, it's only a point above the average, when in fact it's now eight points above the average. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I agree with Fiona. I don't think they stand up the bad hips anymore. Yeah. They stop it already at the vets. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the question that you posed, Penny, yeah. um, I, I just wanted to share a, a quote from a, an orthopaedic specialist who um, used to work at Croft Veterinary Referrals in Northumberland. I attended a seminar that he ran and he stated that he had never in his entire career had to do a hip replacement on a dog from scored parents. Even if, the, even if the scores were higher, if they were from scored parents, he didn't find that he got bad enough hips to do a hip, total hip replacement. That was his, his experience from the dogs that were referred to him. So he, he felt really strongly that it was important to score. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously he was seeing, seeing dogs with worse hips from non -scored. that weren't scored, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and that that's a very valuable point, I think. For you. But I also think it's very important that if you have your dogs X-rayed under the skin, you send them off, even if the vet says, "Oh, these hips are terrible." Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you say, "Oh, I'm not going to waste my fifty-seven, sixty pounds, whatever it is these days, um, and having them scored." Um, you should still send them off because that is why. The breed average is as low as it is. Yeah. We're not sending off the high scored dog, <laughs> the high scoring dogs. And the vets always don't always know because there was, I'm sure there was an incident not that long ago where somebody was told, oh, these hips are absolute rubbish. I wouldn't bother to score them. Oh, and yeah. they came back 15. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of vets tell their clients that, and it's it's wrong. They should be encouraging them to send them off regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are one or two practices. Um, where they insist that the client signs the green and the orange forms when they take them in for the hip and elbow yeah. scoring. Because the that. signature permits the vet to send them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if the, the practice is we will send them off whatever they look like, mm -hmm. um, then what, of course, happens is the client goes elsewhere. Or yeah. what happens is the client just doesn't pay the BVA so they don't get... Well, that's, that's possible, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In our country, for the ECFO certificate, it's also like that. You have to sign before the ECFO uh, vet looks at your uh, dog. Yep. Yeah. So that they can also declare every certificate is in their um, documentations. Yeah, that, that's the same for our eye certificates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You sign before you go in, don't you? Well, before you go in with the eyes, you have no choice. But for some reason, some people seem to think that they can opt out of submitting them if they don't look good yeah. and I think that's wrong I know the last time I had a bitch that didn't whose hips didn't look very good I sent the x-ray in for scoring but we didn't bother doing her elbows so when the vet came back after having done the, the hips and said oh they're not very good um I said well don't bother doing the elbows 
yeah. there is there is a big cost implication yeah yeah and, you know you can't blame some people will decide not to send them off because it's a hundred odd quid that they'll save however now that we can send them to australia for half that price i think there's less of an excuse not to submit them well, I had a situation where I was working in a practice and you'd have thought I'd been working there long enough, they'd have known better. Somebody else x-rayed my dog because it was my morning to consult. Um, and she came in and she said, I don't think it's worth sending these off. And I said, I don't care what you think. You send them <laughs> off. And they came back 39 and that was it, you know. Um, <laughs> but I expected that. But if it wasn't in the system, it doesn't give you a good picture of what is actually happening in the breed. Yeah. 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 And I think there are too many people in our breed and in any breed that are really only interested in how it affects their own dog. Yeah. They do not see it as a benefit to the whole of the breed. And my attitude has always been, we are custodians of the breed, Yeah. us current breeders, and we want to leave the breed in a better state than when we came into the breed. Yeah. And until you get that attitude across, you're always going to have people that are going to duck out of having not so good x-rays sent away. Yeah. The other thing is that it can lead falsely to a dog having a low, or sorry, a good estimated breeding value um, yeah. if you don't submit a bad hip x-ray exactly. from that dog. Yeah. And that's my only worry about the Australian scheme. I, I do think that the, that the KC are going to need to be less insular and publish the results, even if they're from other countries. Other countries can do it. Um, I don't see why the KC can't. Mm. No. Oh, that's a that's a whole uh, a whole new thing, isn't it? Now they've taken the the health tests off the oh. pedigree oh. certificate. Well, talk about a retrograde step. Yeah, yeah. The new um, website is quite difficult for people to navigate even people that are used to the old system and knew, knew vaguely that it was there somewhere, they haven't improved the search feature. If you put in a search for something specific, you're still gonna get 1200 hits and most of them not related to what you wanted. Well, our Kennel Club website just crashed and burns. They made it, <laughs> I can't do anything. I cannot register my letters. <laughs> so, oh. So um, some of the compulsory testing that's involved evolved in our breed has left the average golden retriever breeder scratching their head about what's going on. They can't see the significance of testing for illnesses that they've never seen in their breeding stock or where it's occurred. It's not been an aggressive disease, you know, something like the posterior polar cataract or, or retinal folds that really don't seem to affect the dog or the majority of the dogs, it doesn't seem to be aggressive um, disease um, or increase uh, mortality or morbidity. Recently in the UK, we've had um, gonioscopy has been moved to schedule one and the majority of UK breeders have not seen adult acute angle closure glaucoma in their breeding population. In addition, I think there's been some mistrust developing between um, the veterinary profession and the, and the dog breeders. You know, we've had um, the posterior polar cataract project where we were promised that um, we would have a DNA test, didn't come to anything. And um, we also had a bit of a fiasco here about MRD in the breed. So I feel that there's a bit of a void between the vets and the dog breeders. And I think it's it's a massive shame that this is sort of happened. Um, but we all have a common goal of really wanting to have healthy dogs. And do you think there's anything that we could do to draw the veterinary profession and um, dog breeders a bit closer together? Nathalie? Hmm. <laughs> it's a difficult one. <laughs> Um, no, I think a lot of tests are also just getting discovered already and they don't have uh, enough information. That's like we talked in the panels that they take some tests in just to see where the breed is. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, quite a discussion with our ECFO certificate vet who comes in our clinic about the gonioscopy. 
because I know in the UK it's uh, of great importance now. And I told her I need my dogs to be tested on it. And she said, well, it's no, no sense. It doesn't exist in Goldens. It's only for flat coats and da 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 da. But still, I was shocked. I had more breeders who were interested in doing it. So we did it all. And I was quite shocked that not every golden retriever seems to be gone your clear. Like we see in UK also, we have scores, one, twos, and it's, it's good that we test for it because this is a disaster coming at us if we don't do anything. No, I have never seen glaucoma because of it yet. Mm. so I think we should should not rule it out and maybe just test it and try to if we have a, a gonio positive not a problem but put a gonio negative on it mm. and mm. go from there like we do in every disease yeah yeah I think I think it is um it's a kind of a I think developing a bit of a better relationship though between the dog breeders and and sometimes when we're given a message it, it's we're told that it's a definitive so this is causing acute angle glaucoma so we need mm -hmm. to measure it and things i think it would be much much better if they came in and they said like you we think there may be a problem mm -hmm. we need to study it we need to gather more information and you know so we're going to introduce this as a, as a surveillance for a yeah. defined period of time. But we're also going to look at the, the data that we collect. So look at the results, look at how that then um, affects the actual animal, you know, rather than just introducing something, leaving it where it is. Yeah. Everybody sat there thinking, do I really need to do this? You know, um, mm -hmm. and... I think we're all a bit confused about the way forward, really. Yeah, was that not what, what, what was supposed to happen, Penny? Pardon? Was that not what was supposed to happen with no, Gunnar? It, it, was, it was supposed to be a, a period of data gathering and what have you, and then suddenly, bang, it's on Schedule 1. That's and right. presented with a fait accompli. Yeah. I think that's what's got everybody up in arms about it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the, the Golden Oldies project was intended to test dogs of eight years and above yeah. to characterise the changes in the older dog's eyes, because although there may be an inherited component to the fact that some dogs have got some degree of uh, pectinate ligament abnormality, in an awful lot of these dogs, it doesn't progress. Mm. And we really don't understand how the disease works in Goldens. Mm. It may almost be normal for some for Goldens yeah. to have some degree of PLA from the age of seven. Yeah. But until we get the Golden Oldie project up and running, now I know Fiona's run one clinic, um, but with COVID, we've just not been able to get it going. Mm. Mm. No, well, out of, out of the 40, we saw 40 Golden Oldies here, and um, the vast majority of them were either zero or ones. And I think there was a, a couple of a handful of twos, but there were no threes. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be um, heartening. Um, and the vet that was doing the gonioscopy, he he is kind of sitting on the fence as to whether he thinks we've got a problem. He says that he has seen some some goldens with glaucoma and that it's becoming a problem. But then I've spoken to two other specialists that say. No, we, we hardly ever see glaucoma in Goldens. And, um, you know, yes, by all means, we should monitor this, but um, we don't think that it should be a compulsory thing at the moment. Mm. But it is. Yes. <laughs> well, it is if you're in a short period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think a lot of specialist ophthalmologists or the ones that do our eye testing would not necessarily see cases because... They're acute and yeah. the is going to lose its eye. Now, you may have an ophthalmologist down the road that will see it and confirm it and whatever uh, that isn't on the panel. So therefore, that case never gets reported. Right. It's only vets on the eye panel that report anything and they only ever report it through the annual eye certificate. Mm. So it's just not been, it's not our fault. To be honest, it's the ophthalmologist's fault. 
again, we have seen three cases of glaucoma in a golden this year, and somebody else says, well, I've seen two, and, and then they add the stuff up together, but they're simply not reporting it. And a lot of vets are quite capable of diagnosing it and removing the eye themselves without even involving an ophthalmologist. Yeah. Because it's such an acutely painful condition. And it's obvious. You see. Yeah. It's so obvious. Yeah, you can see it. I mean, yeah, I've, I've seen it in other breeds. I've never seen it in a golden. Mm -hmm. No, it's um, it's a very interesting thing. In humans, um, we are um, you're you're offered free screening if you have a first degree relative with um, any form of glaucoma, and I think that would perhaps have been a bit more of a reasonable way to go. That yeah. you know, rather than putting the whole breed through. Um, this, but if it is a defined period of time and we can gather data and that data gets looked at, yeah. I think then that's beneficial. But if it all goes into that big drawer at the BVA and or disappears down a shredding machine, that that's not really helping anybody, you know. And I do think with the with the eye scheme that whilst they've been examining our dogs, that they could have collected quite a lot of data and 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 recorded it and analyzed it and i don't think that's really happened you know i think it's apart a missed from, opportunity apart from james oliver's paper mm. and he was the one that said oh 17 percent of golden retrievers have got pla we ought to be looking at this yeah okay. but that um, was that that was a quite a small study and he was possibly was 200, 200 and something dogs i think i can't remember it's a long time since i read the paper it's about 60 70 pages and it's quite hard going i have read it but it's, i'm not planning on doing it again no, <laughs> no i know anyway yeah it's an I, think what, I think what has caused the problem is that we wanted um to put it down as a recommendation but the kennel club and the bva in their wisdom made it a requirement for the um, assured breeder scheme yeah. and it was completely against what we wanted. We didn't want to force people to do it, but at the other hand, we wanted to go on collecting information and they've basically taken it out of our hands. Yeah. And I think people resent the fact that they're not listening to us. Yeah. Mm. No, I think, I think really if we could create a, a, a better collaboration between breeders and, and you know, the, the academic vets that I think, it would be much, much better from both sides. We would be more willing to present dogs for, you know, screening or checking or, you know, contributing towards um, furthering knowledge in the breed. Um, I think there is a big gap between specialists' um, attitudes to breeders. They simply don't recognise that a lot of breeders have a huge amount of information and that really good breeders know their dogs really well. Yeah. And they know if something's slightly off. Um, and I just think that there's a certain amount of arrogance comes through from these specialists and they simply don't listen. Oh, you're only a dog breeder. You don't mm. know what you're talking about. Mm. And I think that's not true. I think a lot of breeders do have a lot of knowledge. And I think if they could get the, a lot of these breeders on side, we'd gather far more information. Of course, mm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, carrot, carrot works better than a whip any day. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Um, do you think that more stringent measures should be put in place to ensure that kennel club registered dogs are from the animals they are registered as being from? I know it happens in some country, but it doesn't happen in the UK. Fiona. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think that'll be unanimous. Um, absolutely. Um, I think DNA testing is the way forward. Um, there's too much room for manoeuvrability without um, proof of, of um, the dog's heritage. And I also think it would have a knock-on benefit for proving ownership because with all the pet theft that's going on at the moment, we've had people on forums asking about microchips versus tattooing, etc worried that if their dog is stolen and they track it down that they won't be able to prove it's theirs because tattoos can be cut off microchips can be cut out but if they dna test their dog then that's 
definitive, isn't it? It's on yeah. record. And in a court of law, it would prove that it's their dog and they might be able to get it back. Um, so yes, I do think that, that um, it should be happening in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else got anything to add to that? What's the point in testing a dog? If uh, testing all those PRA and elbow, and if you don't prove that this is the real stud dog of that litter, it all starts with that, that you have a puppy who is chipped, that you know for sure who are the parents. In Belgium, it's, uh, it's by law also uh, necessary, but it's because there has been in the past big uh, schemes with uh, Malinois and German Shepherds from big champions who were never by that parents. So yeah. yes, they should start with microchipping every puppy and knowing for sure that DNA, DNA way wise, father is father and mother is mother. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree. I think I know that we don't do it, but there are an awful lot of unscrupulous people out there. And you're always hearing stories of people who have got pedigrees with their puppies, handwritten pedigrees with their puppies, um, and the fathers have been dead for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's technically possible with AI, but from the sources that they're coming yeah. from, it's not likely. Yeah. yeah. I know in some countries, they, the Kennel Club comes and inspects the litter and microchips them, don't they? I'm not yeah. sure if they take DNA swabs when they do that, but um, you know that would be a good way of making sure that your, your um, registration was completely accurate, wouldn't it? In our country, it's the veterinarian who comes to chip the puppies and take the swab to the kennel club. Okay. So, so you no and do home litters do you or do people bring their puppies in it's both sides you can come to the clinic or the vet can go to go to the house yeah okay it's very mm. good do you not have lay uh microchip implanters in belgium then does it only be done by a vet veterinary surgeon it can only be done by a veterinary surgeon mm. yeah and yeah i think all those tests is only what what's the point of having a pedigree if you cannot be sure that father is father and mother is mother yeah absolutely and as you say the tests and things really without mm -hmm. um, robust evidence of where they've come from could be fairly meaningless isn't it yeah at least let's now do check the microchip number and things when you go yeah. uh, certainly when i first started there was no no necessity for any identity marks so you could have taken any dog anywhere you know to have a and like for health insurance you have a lot of that in uk aren't you then obliged to have a chip in your dog oh we're legally required to have a chip yes uh, for eight weeks for okay. me yeah they can't be sold without a microchip in them okay mm. But you can, you don't have to have a vet to microchip them. Mm. You know, people you can, you can take a course and you pay your money and they um, train you for one day and then you're able to go out in the world and just do it. Yeah, no, you're not. It's really <laughs> an, a veterinary action. <laughs> <laughs> so we've kind of um, touched on this already. Do you think that the current system of health testing could be used in different ways? For instance, testing, you know, for, for a period of time to try and eliminate the disease from a breed or just testing first degree relatives of dogs that say have subaortic stenosis or glaucoma. Anne? I think, I think that you still have to go on DNA testing where you still have carriers and affected. Yes. You can know the offspring. I mean, if you've got a clear to a clear, you're clear by parentage. But I also think that DNA testing, everybody says, oh, too many DNA tests. It makes the gene pool smaller. I think it makes the gene pool bigger because yeah. if you've got, for example, you've got a bitch that's carrying PRA1 mm -hmm. and you've got 50 dogs out there, but only 25 of them are DNA tested for PRA1 
and only 12 of those, or 20 of those, say, are clear. So out of your 50 dogs, you've only got 20 potential sires because the other 25 haven't been tested. And you cannot risk using a potential carrier or affected dog because you know your bitch is a carrier. And I'm sure there are a lot more clear dogs out there, but unless you test them, you can't find them. Mm. And who wants to breed a, a litter of puppies where it's, there's a chance that 50% or 25% of the litter will go blind at, at seven Yeah, with PRA? Unless you test everybody, then you do narrow the gene pool. But if you test them all, then you know exactly where you stand. Yeah. But, but I also think a lot of people don't use DNA tests intelligently. Yeah. They seem to think, oh, it's carrier, I can't, I can't use it or whatever. Whereas if you've got a clear, of course you can use it. Mm. If you keep something that you're planning on breeding from or you sell one to somebody who wants to breed from it, you have to make it a condition that they DNA test that particular puppy because obviously there's a chance that it is also a carrier. Mm. But for, for the most of a pet litter, it doesn't really matter. No. No, and in a way, if you were wanting to keep something that was clear from a carrier, you could DNA test your puppies, couldn't you? Absolutely, I've done that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's a really good tool, isn't it? But it's, it's a very good tool, but it has to be used intelligently and it has to be regarded as a tool and not the be all and end all. Yeah. And you can do it on quite early puppies. Even on two weeks, you already can make a swap. Yeah. 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 Well, when I was talking at the beginning before we really got started about my litter that was my bitch got mismated and then was mated five days later and I had to test the puppies, I actually took blood from them yeah. at three weeks. Well, I didn't, to be perfectly honest, I didn't take the blood because I held the puppies and I have a veterinary nurse that is an absolute wizard at getting jugular veins. <laughs> <laughs> so I held the puppies and she took the blood. Ah. <laughs> and it was much easier than separating the puppies into 10 individual spaces yeah. and away from the mother for two hours before I took the swab. Yeah, yeah but if, if we can take blood from a little chihuahua, we can take from a three weeks old golden. Yeah. And, I, and I, I can also microchip a three week old golden, which I did with my last couple of litters because of the dog thefts. Because my dogs are right in my living room for the first three weeks. But when they get moved through to the end of the house, they're that little bit more exposed. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, I'm not waiting until six weeks to do these. I'm going to do them at three weeks. Mm. Yeah. Just so I can prove they were mine if they got nicked. And I bet at three weeks, they're sort of not really aware of what's going on, are they? They're a little less wriggly and a little less, yeah. yeah. No, I, think, I, think out, I think out of the 16, I had two that bled a little bit. But, you know, that, that soon stopped. And they, none of them made a fuss. Yeah. You think? But, but at that age, they're just, they, you put them on your lap and they're just so cuddly, you can just do them. Yeah. So, my only worry with doing them that young, Anne, is that when they play roughly with one another during that first week after you've put it in and it hasn't encapsulated, that when they're ragging each other by the neck. Didn't happen. I mean, I did I did do them actually just a couple of days before three weeks because I wanted them in and I wanted the whole seal before they moved. Yeah. Um, and when I checked them all as they left, they were all exactly where I put them. Yeah. But they they because I've got seven dogs here whose microchips are all exactly where I put them. <laughs> and one of them is 13, it's not moved in all that time. So, yeah. Fiona, a puppy of six, seven weeks will be more roughly playing than a puppy yeah. of two weeks yeah. or three yeah. weeks. That's what I was just going to say, actually. Although I don't do mine until they're actually leaving to yeah. avoid that situation. No. Um, but yeah, I can see why doing them at three weeks would probably be very good because because they're not rough with one another at that age. Yeah. But it also means that if you want to DNA test them, they've yeah. already got their microchips in. Yeah. yeah. That was actually my point until we got sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we do it also, so young, just to, to clear the DNA tests, that you don't have Mr. Yellow and Mr. Black on the papers yeah. of the DNA tests. Yeah, yeah, no, and then it can go on their pedigrees. Well, or could yeah. it go on their pedigrees? It goes on their <laughs> well, it could, yeah, the used to go on their registration documents, yeah. 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 Nathalie, do you think there's a time, you know, that we could use di the tests in a slightly different way? Well, I think it's uh, the screening of the first degree relatives. I think that's also a good idea in some cases. 
not only for the DNA testings, but like with MRD, you can test a whole litter of puppies on eight to 10 weeks. And I thought this is quite interesting uh, to see what gives true. And um, yeah, I do think we should do more of those kind of tests when we have used something that we say, yeah, maybe we should test the puppies, what gives true and what to expect. Mm -hmm. And like with cataract, you see sometimes one bitch or boy being excluded from uh, breeding, but the siblings are uh, breeding like there is not the problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe we should test them, the family. Yeah, cataract, I think, was it posterior polar cataract? Yes. Yeah, what, yeah. What I, I think that's an interesting phenomenon because I did breed from a dog who developed um, posterior polar cataract when he was eight. Mm -hmm. And he did have quite a few litters and a lot of his progeny were tested. And he mm -hmm. did have a higher rate of effective progeny than any other stud dog. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm slightly confused about posterior polar cataract. It, it rarely seems to affect a dog. And um, I, I'm not 100% convinced about the hereditariness of, um, mm. of it when, you, when you've had that kind of experience, you know. Well, my friend from the bitch Penny that um, failed her eye test at the age of six. Yeah. And she'd already had a litter. Um, and there haven't been any others diagnosed or fail in subsequent generations. Um, yeah. So yeah, it does seem to be kind of random how it um, how it's how it passed on. Yeah. yeah. I had one, my foundation bitch fa failed at seven um, and she'd already had a, a litter and which I bred on from. Um, and I've had over the years two that have failed their eyes. Mm. Um, that I know of. I mean, obviously, mm. you know, a lot of pet people, it never gets diagnosed because it doesn't affect their vision. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing. You have to ask how significant it is when the vast majority of them have oh, right. no impact on their, on their well-being. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But if you have a young dog having cataract at two years and getting uh, blind, that's, that's the important one. That's the yeah. one we want to get out of uh, our breed. Yeah. yeah. And those are the cases I would say it would be nice to test also siblings and yeah. Yes. More. Mm -hmm. do you, Natalie, do you think that there are two different types of cataract then? Because we see quite a lot of dogs that fail at six and seven. Yeah. yeah. And we see a few that's, that fail at their first eye test. Yes, the juvenile cataracts, uh, yeah. those are the ones I'm worried about. And for me, it seems to be a different type than the, the ones we have with the old dog yeah. cataract. I think I'm not bothered with an old dog cataract, but I'm bothered with a, a young dog that I, I don't want to breed from. Yeah. It was because originally described, the posterior polar cataract was originally described as a juvenile cataract. Mm. Um, but it's not been my experience of it. I, I have had it, apart from one, I think in, in tending to be an older age. Um, so maybe it is a different form. I think when I first started breeding, a lot of the older breeders talked about dogs that went blind with cataract. And I'm pretty sure that we've had several different kinds of cataract within the breed. Mm -hmm. And I think that the early efforts of breeders have bred out a much more aggressive, dominantly inherited cataract because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by excluding dogs from the breeding pool. But I think we've tended then to drift off with the posterior polar cataract, which appears to be generally less troublesome. Um, mm -hmm. But, but then seems to have a range of expression from the juvenile right the way through to a much older um, onset, which doesn't seem to progress at all. I had one that failed at eight and lived to 16 and you could flick a biscuit at it at 16 and it would still catch it, you know. Yeah. Or, you know, she definitely wasn't affected by it, but it was a problem, you know, so, but yeah. I think it's, 
we should be thinking about how we use the tools that we are getting um, in our breeding stock. Now, why haven't I got this? So, Anne. Right. <laughs> over to you. Can you explain what the coefficients of inbreeding oh, and how this of inbreeding in is basically a measure of how many common ancestors that you have in a pedigree and lo the lower the better and in an ideal world the dogs would be at least under 10 percent coi above 10 percent you start to get problems loss of sight uh, loss of size less fertility um higher incidence of inherited disease because obviously you're making you're bringing together more genes um, that are the same so you can double up on a a carrier gene and, and infected offspring uh, I don't really panic myself if it comes up to 12.5 now what I really wanted to talk about and this is a screenshot from the new um, kennel club web page which is uh, showing the estimated breeding values and I think enough not enough people understand EBVs and how to use them so the first one is a bitch that has pretty ordinary EBVs. Her hips are just about at zero, um, only 0.074 on the wrong side of zero. Her elbows are good, which means that she's producing better than um, the breed average. The breed average is always set at zero for some reason, and, uh, and everything is me measured as a chance. It's basically a risk. What sort of risk? And you want as much of a negative number as you can. The other thing you need to look at is this thing at the bottom called the confidence interval. Now, EBVs are assessed by, there's a very complicated algorithm that takes into account the parents, the grandparents, the siblings, the offspring. And it, it comes up with these figures. And the more relatives, close relatives that you have uh, tested, the higher the confidence interval. And basically under 60%, it's not really worth looking at. But you all, and you also find in Goldens that almost always the confidence interval for hips is higher than for elbows, which suggests that there are an awful lot of people that are still not doing elbows as they should be. Mm. Can you go on to the next slide? Jenny? Oh, no. sorry. Okay. Now this is a dog that has a... Uh, zero elbows and four to hips. He's had uh, a reasonable number of elbows. He's again above 60% and he's got a confidence interval of 76.9, nearly 77% on the hips. So that's a pretty accurate thing. Basically it suggests that he's gonna produce better than average for the, for the breed. What you're actually looking at is the white dot and you want that white dot to be as far into the green as you as you can for, for good hips. If we go on to the next one, next slide, Penny. This is a bitch. Who, yeah, this is a bitch that's got absolutely rubbish EBVs. Her elbows, she's got an elbow score of one. She's got a sister who's got an elbow score of zero one. Um, her mother and her grandmother and a father and a grandfathers are all zero but where that came from I don't know but I mean her hips are only 15 um her elbows are only one she's got an awful lot going for her but she's likely to produce worse than herself in hip uh, in elbows but and very slightly worse than herself in hips because the little white dot is to the right towards the red side yeah. Now, if you were to ma mate this bitch to the previous dog, you would you would reduce the um, elbow score quite considerably, and you would uh, decrease the hip risk quite considerably. So that would be a possible thing to use. So this is a tool. It's not a guarantee. It's a probability. But if you're dithering between two animals to use on your bitch, 
this and your bitch is not good. Say she's got a one elbow score. You really want to look for a dog that's got an excellent elbow score. Um, and the same with the hips. So it's just one more thing that you can look at. And I could quite, I would quite often, I've quite often used this. If I'm dithering between two dogs, I will look at the dog's EBV. And I will also, the other thing you can do on this system is that you can put in the two parents and work out what the COI is of the offspring. So well, you can they, do test mating, can you? Yeah, you can do a test mating, as it were. Mm. So, I mean, she's nine, which I think is perfectly acceptable. It says the breed average is 7.9, which I think is quite low. I would have thought it was higher because, after all, all our goldens go back to four original dogs. Mm. We don't have a huge gene pool. Mm. And if you do a 10-generation pedigree, you're going to find some dog in there 20 times. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of shared genes more than five generations back. And the other problem with the COI is that we have started using foreign dogs more. The pet passport was an absolute boon to dog breeders because we could go abroad and use all sorts of other dogs. But unless the dog came to this country and had an ATC, the Kennel Club doesn't have a pedigree. So it goes in as a zero. If it's got an ATC number, you'll have three generations of dogs in there but that's all so if you read here 25 generations available of which five are complete and that's because her grandmother is a portuguese dog and it's never been shown here so there's nothing there's it's just not there on the pedigree so they call it zero yeah yeah so fiona and if they um, put a dog, a foreign dog in, because it's got an ATC or whatever, so they've got the three generations of a pedigree, um, they won't have the health results for the three generations. No, they won't. You know? So it doesn't, so that doesn't give you any information on the EBVs either, yeah. which is why we go back to the argument that the Kennel Club should actually start to become a little bit more international, yeah. less insular, and start yeah. recording the health results for the foreign dogs. And this is why the confidence interval is so important because if you've got a lot of foreign dogs in the pedigree, the confidence interval is going to be low and therefore the EBV is going to be less accurate. Right. So you still need the 60%. It's interesting um, because we use a lot of the canine data. Yep. That would be nice if the EBV was on that because there is much more information on the canine data than on the kennel club. Internationally yep. seen. Yeah. Internationally pool data, isn't there? Yeah. I think the, the problem would arise is that you would actually have to assign a definitive number to the FCI grades. And that's where the problem arises because you can't, into an algorithm, you can't put A, B, C. You actually have to put the number in. Yeah, but you can. You should. You, could, you should be able to do it. Even yes. If you, did, you know, A is naught to four. If you only put it in as four, it, at least it would give you some indication. Yeah. So, but I just think this is a very good tool. That it's a very good tool, but wait, in Belgium, the genetics wanted to create that too, but then make our breeding liberty uh, less. Then ah, yes. the computer would tell us which dog we can use on which bitch. Mm. And that we really don't want. No, yeah. certainly. Based on the EBVs. That. <laughs> because, because again, that what, this is what again what we were talking about earlier. That is taking away the art of breeding. Mm. Yeah. You know what dog you want to use on your bitch, whatever the results are. And again, no system has all the dogs of the world on it. No, so. it doesn't. But all I'm saying is, if you've got a bitch like mine who has got a one elbow score and a very slightly above average hip score. You can get a good indication yeah. of, well, you've got your EBV, so of the dogs I can choose from or that I would like to use, I would tend in this circumstance to use something that's going to move that little white dot to the left yeah. for the puppies. Now, this hasn't been updated since the 30th of September, and I have since had her daughter scored, 
And she's come back zero elbows and a lower hip score, 13 hips. So that her EBV will alter. And that's the other thing about EBVs is that the more animals you put in, yeah. each time they rerun the algorithm, it will alter depending on how many more progeny um, you, you've got. When I first used this dog, this bitch's father, his EBV on elbows was really good. It was about 57 or something like that, minus 57. And by the time I came to score the daughter, his EBV had dropped to about 15 because he's had so many progeny scores, some of which had elbow scores. So it's affected his EBV and it's changed. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fixed thing. You have to keep checking them. But I just wanted to make sure that people understood what, what you're reading here and how you can use it if it's important. I mean, you may all have wonderful dogs with really low hip scores and zero elbows, but some of us are not so lucky. We live in the real world. <laughs> I, I'm interested, Anne, about how, um, how, how apparently bad that looks in relation to the fact that she scores 1-1 one, one and she's got a sibling with a 0-1 and it's pushed it way over into the yeah. red. Particularly when she's got grandparents and parents that are all zero. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in fact, going back three generations, she's got a bitch uh, who's a, I think she's her great grandmother, who's three, three on elbows. Now, am I, what, am I seeing that coming down three generations, four generations? Mm -hmm. See, that'd be my bitch. I'd never bred from it, whatever it's EBV said. But, you know, it's too late now. It's there in the pedigree. Mm -hmm. And you take a gamble because the, the, the daughter and the granddaughter or the grandson have come back naught. But then mm -hmm. you, you find this pops up. Yeah. So yeah. I, I can see this can be a really useful tool if you've got, um, it, when you're starting to sort of hone in on certain dogs that you're thinking for your bitch. So you've got you've decided you're going to breed from her and she's got a lovely temperament and all the other nice things. And you, you've selected maybe a few dogs with different pedigrees. And then if you can have a look at this and maybe do some test matings, that may help you to decide. Yeah. It, it, it's, really it's just great. another tool. It is not so, the end all. And it does alter the more progeny and siblings that are tested, mm. but it's a useful tool. Yeah. Properly. But say if you had a young bitch who had, say, bad hips, it was stunning and you really wanted to breed from her. If you could choose a dog that has a lot of offspring that have been scored. Yeah. And, and who was to have a, a very reliable um, EBV. Yeah. Um, that may help you, mightn't it, to make that um, yeah. a better choice yeah, for I would never make this my only choice. No. As I said to you, I start off by looking at a, for a dog I like. I look at its offspring yeah. and see what it's producing. I then look at its pedigree and see whether that fits in with my lines. Yeah. I then look at its health tests. I then do a COI projection on the what the puppies would be. And right. I look at the EBVs, compare them to mine. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's it's all part of the... And I can't even tell you how much I, I, emphasis I would put on any one part of that. A lot of it is feeling that that would be okay. Um, or that I really think that he's got so much to offer that I'd use him even if his um, elbow EV, EBV was only minus 20 or something. I'm, yeah. I'm not looking for a dog that's got a minus 73 to completely balance it out. All I'm trying to do is reduce the risk somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Thanks for that, Anne. That's really Thanks. useful. But by uh, also, just like you tell in your first step, you choose a boy based on what he gives and what his progeny is, what his father gives. Actually, you're yeah. actually doing your own EBV there. Of course. Already. Of course. But, yeah. but that... Most breeders yeah. already do that a bit. Only but that you can number on it. You can have a dog that looks lovely and, and moves really well. And when you look it up, you find it's got a 40 hip score. Mm -hmm. Because just because it's got bad hips doesn't mean it doesn't move well, because a lot of no. dogs do. So, yeah, I mean, there's lots of stages and a lot of people will do it in a different order than I do. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
So Fiona, what's your opinion about line breeding? Well, um, if we're trying to reduce um, the coefficient of inbreeding, then I expect we shouldn't be doing too much line breeding, but then all the big breeders in the past um, were passionate about line breeding. Um, I was always taught by my mentors that you um, that you can go in once and then come out again, and that you shouldn't just keep um, line breeding. You know, at what point does line breeding become inbreeding? Yeah. Um, I do have certain dogs that I try not to double up on because of just intelligence that has been gathered, um, whether it's right or not, but there are risks that I'm not prepared to take. Um, I think every mating you do, there's an element of risk and luck. Um, and as Anne said, you have to weigh up how much you want the positives um, and whether you're prepared to include a negative that you're aware of. Um, I think I'm not somebody who is trying to produce um, peas in a pod. Um, same as when I'm judging, I'm not I'm not trying to look for a bunch of dogs that all look identical. Um, if, if each individual dog fits the breed standard, even if it's a different type, then I'm happy. Um, so I'm not too bothered about fixing a type in my kennel. I think I've got, although somebody did say to me recently, gosh, you've got a type. And I don't think I have. I think I've got quite a mixture of types. Um, and trouble is, it's like a box of chocolates. I can't possibly choose. I like them all. <laughs> so um, I'm not. I'm not too bothered about line breeding. I'm more bothered about choosing a dog that suits my bitch and that I think will bring what I feel she needs to improve on um, to her. And that's then in conjunction with, I actually do it in the same, um, the same way as you do, Anne, the same um, process of the dog you know that suits the bitch and then looking at his uh, pedigree and health tests and whatever um we all have shopping lists when we're choosing a, a stud dog and i don't think i've ever managed to find something that ticked every single box and that i was 100 percent confident about but you take a leap of faith and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't um so yeah line breeding I know that some people really swear by it, but um, it's not it's not something that I get too hung up on. Okay, thank you, Natalie. I agree. I um, I'm not so into line breeding. I prefer prefer a good outcross, um, and I do tend to go to type breeding. I like a certain type, and I'm trying to find say a same type. I'm not totally against line breeding, of course not, because I know great dogs have been made by line breeding. But like Fiona says, go to it and go away from it again. Not stick on to every time doing the same uh, things. And if you line breed, I prefer doing that on a dog that I know that has a, a long livity, good temperament. So really, I know myself, not only by books or her says, really, a dog yeah, that yeah, I yeah, trust yeah. that all the information is correct and which I want to double mm. his qualities or her qualities. Mm. I think that's very important to have first-hand knowledge mm -hmm. of the dogs that you are considering line bre breeding to. You know, you can't do it from photos or mm. as you say, hearsay, it's just not robust way of doing it. Yeah, thank you. Anne, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think that we are all to a certain degree line breeding because our gene pool is narrow. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, there's going to be something that you're doubling up on back there. Um, it depends on how many generations you want to go back before you stop calling it line breeding. Yeah. And I was, my mentor always said, go in twice and out once. Um, but I'm not usually happy to do that. I tend to go in and out. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. But if you look at the coefficient, um, the COA, then after 10 generations, we are all line breeding, like you say, Anne. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, 
it's quite interesting when you look in canine data, isn't it, where it gives you a list of um, the, the more influential dogs in your pedigree. Mm -hmm. And it'll be something like Camrose Talleyrand or, you know, a dog from a long way back. Yeah. And I know Hazel used to say to me that you get end up with what she called a knitting pattern pedigree, where very much further back off the five generations, you if you if you did an extended pedigree, you would then see the scope of what you're who you're really line breeding to, because you may have a dog, as you said before, Anne, that occurs 20 or more times. Yeah, and the tenth and yeah. it's off the five generation pedigree. Mm -hmm. and that's another feature I like of canine data is, is that you can click back very easily, you yeah. know, um, just by selecting dogs. So yeah, thanks very much. So I think any tips for male fertility and about advice about keeping a stud dog? Well, I think this must be Natalie's question because yeah. <laughs> I don't have stud dogs. <laughs> I feel they are watching me now. <laughs> Over to well, you, Natalie. I can't say um, it's very important that you let your dog ch be checked, it's sperm checks, because most of the patients we see come in because they have had let some bitches empty. And actually, you should actually start with a boy from one year age to go to the vet for a sperm check. Just check if everything is okay. A young boy of 10 months can be totally infertile, okay? But at one, between 12 and 15 months, he should produce semen that is of good quality and it will improve with the age of two, but at 12, 15 months, he should be good. And there are lots of things that go wrong. You can see here, I put the picture in of all the normal and abnormal sperms. And some of the sperm cells are badly made in the testis, but others are badly made, badly finished up. Like sometimes we see an older dog who has um, the droplets. You're uh, almost there on a bit on the right side, under, in the middle down. Um, yes, yes, that one, that one, yes. They have the little black spots on their tails, that's the droplet. And that actually is not a fault made by the testicles, but that's the fault made by the um, um, epididymis. Just that's giving us information where is the problem of that dog. And we see that a lot in older dogs, that the finishing up of the sperm isn't good enough but it implies also that that sperm will not enter an egg anymore because something we, we call it like it has a color and it can't get in the egg anymore. And the higher up that droplet is, the more influence it has to be infertile. Mm -hmm. So it's not because you see uh, some sperms wiggling under the microscope that everything is okay. You should really make a smear and color them and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And there are, I think it's the importance, well, doing an AI gives that opportunity every time to check also on the sperm quality. I think it's a great advantage every time you go for uh, an AI that the sperm is checked. Also, I've seen here cases where the happy dog and bitch owner are here on my uh, parking lot and I'm taking the semen, checking it under the microscope and I must say, I'm sorry, but I have bad news for you. There is not a good quality semen. I can't do the insemination because you will have no puppies. And sometimes I have very stubborn people to say, yes, but put it in anyhow. And then surprise, surprise, 24 days later, she's empty. It's yeah. a shame. We have those tools and we should use it. And there's a lot of things that go wrong and that can give us a hint. Think about the boy when you take semen who has a bit of blood in it. Mm. It's, it's a hint that something is wrong with his prostate. He can have benign hypertrophic hyper, uh, prostatic dis disease, mm. or he can have a prostatic abscess or a tumor. So it's very important information for a stud dog owner to have it checked. 
And sometimes we have a, nor a nervous dog coming in for an, uh, a checkup and there are tools to know, doesn't he, is he really infertile? We get no sperm from that dog. Is he really infertile or was he just too stressful to give us the sperm rich fraction? So also that is, a, is a, a tool that can help us. We take, we can take blood tests, we can take the semen testing, also bacteria like mycoplasms are getting more and more in our uh, daily clinic uh, being a problem for even the girl and the boy. We have infertile boys because of the mycoplasm also. So it's important to, to have him checked. And mm -hmm. for the boys also, I think a stud dog owner must be aware of orchitis. So when your boy is getting very, very sick, high fever, painful in the scrotum, I think lots of people don't know that yet. You should really be a shower, give him a cold shower on the scrotum and head up to the vet as soon as possible. Any bacteria trauma can cause that. It's very painful for the dog and it can cause him total infertility. Also some medication you should not give to a stud dog because some medication really make it uh, impossible to be fertile. Is that steroids? Steroids are also one of those uh, medications that should not be given. And then thinking and to all those dermatitis patients, yeah. like the atopic patients, they give them steroids without thinking that it's a stud dog. Mm. Mm. So there are lots of things we have to check and um, yeah, regular check at stud dog is a very important thing. How, how often would you recommend that you had a semen analysis done if you weren't using your dog for AI, if it was just for a sexual health check? Well, between every six months would be a, a reasonable time between because it takes two months for the testicles to produce the new load of, te of uh, sperm. So every six months is not a overkill. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Is there any advice about how often you should do use your dog to actually mate? You know, some very well used stud dogs that are used, I don't know, several times in a week. Does that affect fertility? Well, we see that the sperm, the quant the quality can be okay, but the quantity will go down. Mm -hmm. We've seen here when I was starting in Goldens, I know a breeder who went an agenda for his stud dog, morning, noon, evening. Yeah. Really, and that dog produced morning, noon, and evening. So it's rubbish that people say, oh no, not twice on the same day because it won't work. It will work, but give the time, give the dog the time to load again let us say because yeah, yeah. you know if we if we freeze semen the day we are freezing semen we let the dogs come in at nine o'clock in the morning and some people choose to have a second try to have more straws uh, frozen and we put them at 11 o'clock back and we have again a nice quality and quantity of semen so don't be afraid to use the same stud twice or three times a day, but don't do that for a week, a whole week, three times a day. That's, then the bottle will, will be empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you, you, you said it take, can take two months for the, um, for the actual process of regenerating yeah. sperm. Yeah. So if, if you do use a dog very heavily, will he actually produce more sperm? No. 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 So, the, yeah. So there's a limit. So how long you could continue to use a dog at that level? Yeah, you have to give him the rest also. But yeah, if it's a healthy dog, well nourished, I think you can go for a very long period. Mm -hmm. But it's all individual. Uh, there's a difference individually. But mm -hmm. it means also the two months, you don't forget that if you have given him steroids, two months later, you can have the effect of it. So yeah. don't forget that too, because sometimes I say, oh no, we, di we didn't give any medications or he was never sick, but we ask for a fever or a medication within the last two months. And mm -hmm. those that's something that they forget. Yeah, 
Yeah, because you won't be regenerating sperm if, yeah. if the testicles have taken a hit. Yeah. From and that. it's normal. A young dog doesn't take as much time than an older dog. The quality of the semen also gets worse by age. We see more of those droplets, like I said. We see more prostatic uh, problems with the older dogs. So the quality of the semen deteriorates. Mm. But that's, I think, logical. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, sometimes I'm amazed that we have boys of 11 years that we can still freeze. Some yeah. just didn't read the book and are very, very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to skip this question because we've already discussed it. Um, so any tips on any pre-mating workup for your bitch to optimize her health and breeding potential prior to mating? Carry on, Natalie. Well, we always start with, a, I think, a healthy, well-nourished bitch not being too fat, because sometimes we see the fat bitches coming in and we know fertility-wise that they are not so good. Mm. They will have less chances on getting pregnant. So, yeah. okay, take a good dog, uh, a good bitch that is well-nourished and perfect health. Don't forget to deworm and vaccinate your dog also, your bitch. Because don't forget that uh, when you vaccinate a bitch, you actually provide the puppies antibodies by the milk. So when I have a bitch that I want to make a litter, whatever vaccination status she has, I make her a full vaccination. So she will have lots of antibodies in her milk for the puppies. That is doesn't that, want- Is that prior to mating then, Natalie? No, let us say that every year they are vaccinated here with us and mm -hmm. not for all the vaccines because leptospirosis we do yearly, but like some other uh, diseases we do every two or three years. Mm -hmm. But when I plan a litter in that year, I will make her a full vaccination, whatever her plan is. Leptospirosis will be done um, and all the rest will also be done because I really want those puppies to have everything but not just prior to mating, not if she's in season day one, I will not go vaccinate her. You should have done that when planning the litter. Let's say in March, you think she will be in season. So January vaccination wise should be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the herpes virus uh, vaccination that we do when they are just around timing of um, mating. Yeah. yeah. Also the deworming that we do on day one. First day of uh, season, we deworm our bitches again. So again, I don't like to give any medications to a bitch who is uh, pregnant. So do it before, if you can. Yeah, because the pro before they all uh, dewormed at day 20, uh, 42 in the pregnancy, I don't like that to do. Every medication can give us problems with the puppies, deformed puppies and everything. We've seen so many cases also where veterinarians are giving antibiotics in the first week after um, mating or just before mating. We don't like that too, because like Anne told us already uh, a few days ago, every bitch has a vaginal flora and there have to be bacteria in it. So don't try to make a sterile bitch because sometimes we hear also that they have to do that for the stud dog owner, that they have to do a smear and they can't have any bacteria. It's rubbish. Every bitch has bacteria there. And actually, if you if you put them on antibiotics, you're at risk of killing the healthy mixed yes. flora and allowing yes. a more virulent bacteria to proliferate and cause yes. a problem. Yes, it is. And the time, the, the time you have to give the bitch a proper antibiotics, if she really needs, it's like in some cases of mycoplasm, you don't have the time if you start with the season. You have to do that in anastrus between two seasons in between. Then you have the time to give her a proper three weeks treatment. If she really has mycoplasm and it causes the problem, then you need the time to give her a strong antibiotic who will not affect the puppies and that you can give long enough. So if you plan a litter, you should start your veterinary um, visit quite early, in between two seasons. Mm. Mm. That's yeah. very interesting. Mm. Very good advice. 
Can I just add to that that sometimes bitches do have infections? I've had a bitch miss and I swabbed her because she'd missed and she had a pseudomonas infection, which would have stopped her getting pregnant. Yes, but what can you do if you know she's a pseudomonas and she's already three days in heat? Well, exactly. Should... I mean, 10 days on Marbacil and hope she's late. But um... <laughs> <laughs> they will not be late, those bitches. <laughs> Oh. She's this time, she's on what day 17 and she's still not ready. Um, but I've stopped the Barbasil. Um, Did she have a discharge or any other symptoms? No, not, not at all. But we tried to do a TCI insemination and couldn't get through the cervix because it was so inflamed. Oh, yeah. And the retrovet um, suggested that I swab her, um, which I did. Mm -hmm. And she had a pseudomonas infection. And then the next season I swabbed her again and she had, a, it was back. Yeah. Mm. But she is a dog that lies down in muddy puddles and sort of slides along. Mm. So, um, and she swims a lot. So I just assume that she must reinfect herself from the environment because it's in the environment all the time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, of course, because dogs are, are chewing and licking things and yeah. um, then cleaning them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fiona, have you anything to add to what you would do to? I was interested to hear that Natalie doesn't like to use fenbendazole during pregnancy. Um, years and years ago, when we used to warm puppies with with piperazine citrate, and they scoured horribly, and it was yeah. and you saw worms coming out like spaghetti. Um, one of my very early litters, I uh, warmed. And then 10 minutes later, I found the tablet on the floor and I didn't know which puppy had brought it up and I didn't dare worm all of them again. So I left them. And um, a couple of weeks later, they had such a heavy worm burden or this individual puppy, it became obvious which one had vomited up the tablet. Um, it was anemic and we very nearly lost him. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, it was Herxt at the time that was making Panicure 10% and they had just started trialing it for bitches in whelp for reducing prenatal infection. And um, so that bitch obviously had a big worm burden to pass to our puppies. So the next litter, um, I did her from day 40 through to three days post whelping. And when I wormed the puppies, there was nothing and they were lovely, healthy puppies. And since then, I have done every single litter with Fenbendazole, and I've never had problems um, until quite recently, but I don't think that that's linked to Fenbendazole. Um, I've had a few bitches miss this last couple of years, as, as you know, Natalie, because you've kind mm -hmm. of given me advice. Um, so I, I do like the fact that I have puppies born without that already loaded um, worm burden. And I also think that it helps with reducing the worm burden in the environment if you're warming your, your bitches in that way. Um, yes, Fiona, you, I'm not saying that fenbendazole is not a good one to give at 42 days, but it's better to deworm your bitch every three months or every four months in her life and then do it the first day of her season that yeah. also reduces her worm, worm uh, that she gives through and you are not giving medications while she is pregnant. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But I have done some cases of hookworm that the bitch is coming in, she's in, uh, in whelp, uh, in, uh, she's pregnant and she has hookworm. Then we have to give uh, fenbendazole because I don't want those puppies being born in an environment full of hookworms. Yeah. We're seeing a, a lot of Giardia cases in the UK. Here too, it's, everywhere. It's practically <laughs> endemic now, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I suppose that's my other rationale in that if if um, if I'm treating with Panicure, um, then that never really gets a hold. Um, I like the Panicure with the puppies on two, four, six, eight weeks. Yeah. But I have the impression, I don't know what your impression is, Anne, that we still have Giardia, even if we are treating with Panacur as good. I've seen, like you say, Fiona, so many cases of Giardia, it's everywhere now. I've never had any problems with Giardia, but I also follow the same protocol as Fiona. 
And my rationale for doing that is that the worms that cross the placenta from the bitch are not gut worms, which would be removed by worming her at the beginning of her season, but they are the insisted larvae in the muscles that are released by the hormones of pregnancy. Yes, we know. That is. Larva crossing the placenta and maturing in the puppies. But don't you... Their benzoyl's taken out. Don't you treat your bitches on uh, uh, two weeks when you do the, the puppies? Yes, I do. But I never see any worms. I haven't seen worms in my dogs for the last 25 years, ever since I started using Fembenzol from day 40. Yeah. The only time I have seen worms come out after a wormer is when I bought in a six month old that had been reared in kennels and it had been wormed up to 12 weeks and hadn't been done since. And when I got it home, I thought, well, she's six months, I better give her a worm tablet. And I used milbamycin, so, so she should have killed the worms, but basically she just pooed out pure worms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is very interesting because I do think wormers have got so much better over the years. I, I'm with Fiona when, you know, could, you could see visible um, worm infestation in puppies, you know, 40 years ago. Oh, and I, I had to go first. Did they sit the worms up? Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to put the light on. It's getting dark in here. Yeah. So... To vaccinate against herpes or not? Do you do it, Fiona? Um, I've just started. <laughs> okay. um, again, on Natalie's advice, because I had a couple of bitches missed, and um, I'd had a conversation with a repro vet in the UK who said, oh, it's a waste of time vaccinating against herpes. It's only any good if you're having fed eaten puppies. But the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. And I thought, well, I'm going to um, vaccinate my bitch who whelped last night. Um, and coincidence, I don't know, but I'm happy I've got puppies and she was done with herpes um, a, a one week after mating and one week before whelping. So. Okay, so maybe maybe a positive, positive yeah. thing. Yeah. And I, I intend to I go always, on doing it. I always vaccinate mine before I mate them. And usually, I do it about four or five days before I expect them to be ready. So this time should have been done about a week in advance because there is a tiny chance that you will get a reaction to the vaccine. Um, it's about one in 10,000, but I'd rather it wasn't my bitch. And I'd rather it didn't happen seven days after I've mated her at the time when we're starting to get ready for implantation. Yeah. So I don't want my bitch having a massive allergic reaction and a fever and possibly preventing implantation happening. So I like to do mine beforehand. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. You only do it at the time. Again, about seven to 10 days before their due date. Yeah, okay. Well, so the first herpes vaccination uh, protects for the abortions and the second vaccination is for the puppies, for the first two weeks of the puppies. And we've seen some cases of severe herpes where you where they lose the whole litter except some that we could have uh, helped by making ourselves uh, the serum for uh, the puppies so yes once you have seen some litters dying crying and actually breeders asking begging you to kill those puppies because herpes is doing it you really know why you're vaccinating and i've done some courses on neonatology and also there, I remember Amer an American professor telling us, why wouldn't you use it? You have it, use it, because it's such a great tool. Yeah. But how long, so long, long does it give us, how long does it give immunity for, Natalie? Excuse me? How long does it give immunity for? Too short, because you have to do it every time that you have a litter. Sorry, so that's you? why you really need the two injections to be done. Okay, so it doesn't. It doesn't last eight weeks. It's nothing. It's doing nothing for the bitch. Herpes yeah. is one of the, the herpes family the puppies. that live yeah. in the yeah. cell. Yeah. But what you're doing is producing antibodies in the bitch's blood mm -hmm. to cross over in the colostrum to protect the puppies. Yeah. But the puppy, the, the bitch doesn't have a problem. It's always like oh. you have toxoplasma in a in a in a human. If yeah. you were never having toxoplasma as a human 
and you are pregnant and getting it, then yeah. you will lose your baby. That's the, sh the same thing in the herpes with the dog. Exactly. Yeah. But so there's no point in vaccinating the male. No. It's going to protect the dog. Yeah. And the other thing about herpes is it happens with, well, herpes simplex that causes cold sores and the varicella that causes chicken pox. Um, when you're stressed, the virus yeah. pops out of the nerve cells and starts to infect you. And the same thing happens with the bitch. When they're stressed at the end of pregnancy and their temperature drops, because herpes likes a lower temperature, yeah. then the, the virus escapes from the cells and the puppies can get infected as they're born even, um, because it can be excreted in the vaginal fluid. And that's why you need the antibodies in the colostrum to protect the puppies. Yeah, and that's why it's so important that you give colostrum to your babies in the first four to eight hours after birth. Yeah. yeah. I can't and, understand these people that buy colostrum substitute and go on feeding it for a week. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the gut shut after 12 yeah. hours maximum. You've got to get it in quick. Yeah, it is. It is. And the question of the stud dogs, it actually has been uh, proven by um, the professors in Paris that it's really no sense in vaccinating herpes in stud dogs. Okay. So don't do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's an interesting one because they're, they're now uh, in humans, um, we vaccinate women against HPV virus because it's one of the causes of the main cause for cervical cancer. Um, and, but obviously the, it can affect men too, but in different ways. And they're now starting to talk about vaccinating males as well against mm -hmm. HPV at school. So that was the reason for asking that question. So, oh, Natalie, another one for you. <laughs> I'm knowing when your bitch is ready. <laughs> Wait, I think Fiona wants to ask something. Yeah, yes, oh, please. Yeah. Whilst I think of it, um, can I ask Natalie, have you um, had any issues with brucella um, infection? I know that in America, it's a big thing they test for. Along yes, with we've now... Here we didn't have any problems. Uh, in Western Europe, there is not a lot of brucellosis, but we have to take care when we import dogs because sometimes we can have abortus due to brucella. Yeah. But it's actually very rare, rare cases. Um, the, reason, the reason I ask is because only yesterday on um, a veterinary forum, um, a vet mentioned that the laboratories in the UK have now asked the practices to let them to, to flag up if they're sending in a sample from a Romanian import, they want to know because they are seeing a lot of brucella um, yeah. in Romanian imports. And that worries me because that's going to get into our population. It and will cause us problems. I think it's like a mycoplasm. We didn't hear from it, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, and now we hear it in the whole Europe. Yeah. So, yes, we have to pay attention. All those importations we have bring also new diseases with us. Yeah. Like we're seeing so many cases of leishmaniasis in the UK from yeah. imported dogs. Yeah, and it at is. At the moment, we don't have the necessary vector to transmit it. So we just have to hope that global warming keeps us cool enough that the sand fly can't survive. Yes, but that's the problem we have. We have now summers in Belgium where we have 35 degrees. So fix those vectors, they will all come. We will have new uh, diseases that we have to learn as a vet now. Yeah. I think we're safe in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I've seen Scotland twice at 30 degrees. <laughs> well, only when you come. <laughs> Can't wait to come back then. <laughs> So, any tips for knowing when your bitch is ready, Natalie? Oh yes, I'm so uh, frustrated sometimes that people are still looking at um, the tail reflex of the bitch. Like Anne told, I also had a bitch who was uh, flagging to the males at a, a progesterone of zero point something, so really not ready. But some breeders still believe in just looking at uh, the behavior. Also, the fixed data of day 11, the day that you should breed from a bitch, is so far away from the truth. Yeah. Some bitches yeah. are ready on day 7, and we've seen them up till day 28 to be ready. Yeah. yeah. So please do some real testings. 
-hmm. and um, yeah, vag vaginoscopy, so looking at the vagina folds, it can help, but you have to be so, uh, so um, you have to do it a lot to see it. Like when we do a TCI with the camera, we can really say, oh yeah, she's a bit earlier, she's good. That we can see. But if you don't do that on a daily basis, you won't see it. So vagina vaginoscopy, I think, is uh, not the best thing to do. So cytology together with progesterone is the best way to go. The progesterone uh, is for me the gold standard to do. And then you also have to know there are different types of machines. So you really need to do a progesterone and need to know the results within the 12 hours because I've had some UK clients who take their progesterone and know the results two days later. That's no sense. No. You really need to know it. We, here we have a mini Vidas in the practice and within an hour we know it. And we know it's really, really trustable. Um, Imolite is a very good machine but there are some other testings for progesterone who are really bad. We have, I've seen some color tests. I all tried them out. I double checked them all with the golden standard lab and I'm something, sometimes very disappointed. So when we do our frozen semen, we are really into, it has to be a good machine and it has to be reliable. And then you also have the values who are so different between some countries but you always have to ask to the breeder, are you talking in animals or in what are you talking? Because there's a big difference. For one in nanogram, they are already at 10. Well, in nanomoles, they are already around 30. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not the number that tells us so much. It's the way she goes to that point. Because actually what we are looking for is the day that she ovulates we are not interested in a value of 12 or five or six. We are interested in when does she ovulate? And that's why we use cytology next to it. Because when you do the smears, every time they come for the progesterone, you can really see like on the screen, you have uh, an image where, they is, where the bitch is too late. Mm -hmm. She had a progesterone of 25, but you already have the neutrophils. So some cells, are, have the nucleus already they are rounder and we have the neutrophils and the bacteria coming so i can yeah. have a bitch of 25 nanogram per milliliter who is perfect to mate and you can have a bitch like that who is just too late mm -hmm. so it's very important information and when do you when do you uh, inseminate the bitch two days after ovulation because the bitch is one of those species that needs 48 hours maturation of the egg before the sperm can get in it. So don't come too early. Yes. <laughs> or too late. And don't come too late either. And yeah. if you do those testings, those progesterone together with the uh, smears at the cytology to predict ovulation, you can also predict perfectly the dates that she will give birth because they have tested that they are giving birth 63 days after ovulation. So it's such an important information for us too. It's 63 days plus minus one day. So it's only three days we have to take in consideration, mm -hmm. except for before we had to wait between 57, 57 and 68 days. That was a whole 10 days that we had the difference. So what my colleague and I do, we have an agenda and we know this bitch will give birth that, those three days, this bitch will give those days and we arrange our schedule to it. It's really easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what's the purpose of combining the progesterone with the cervical cytology? Because you can see better the ovulation time. You really have the cells who uh, change a lot on the big picture you have, you have the cells with the nucleo, yeah. the nucleus, the nucleus, and that really disappears. You have, uh, I don't know the name in English, it's Hollandbeeld, and oh, Hollandbeeld yeah. is yeah. really a change of the smear, and it's so nicely to see, but it's not the golden standard, but to, because we have some individual change and some breeds who are very difficult 
like in flat coat retriever, it's hell to do a cytology because he do does never change. And in most breeds, you really have a very accurate moment of ovulation that you can see on the smear. Yeah. And that compared with your progesterone will give you perfect information. Okay. I've only ever used this, the cytology. I've, I've done progesterone testing one and um, the bitch missed. So I went, <laughs> I went back to the cytology because I found that very accurate. Yeah. Well, not in all cases. <laughs> No, no, no. It's interesting, isn't it? So, pregnancy tips and ensuring healthy pregnancy and any common problems? Uh, well, don't stress the bitch. It's, I think it's a very important thing that the bitch has a normal life. I always say to my clients, she's in well, she's pregnant, she's not sick, so don't treat her as a sick bitch. Let her have her activity. It's like in humans, I think. If we are in bed all the time, it's not good. We need to be muscled well and have a healthy pregnancy. Yeah. So I like to do the x-ray too. I know there is lots of discussion about it, but we do the x-ray at day 55 of the bitch. She is in no stress. The person accompanying her is helping make us the picture. So the bitch is like one minute on the table together with her owner and we can really count the puppies. If you count them directly, because sometimes they send us pictures from uh, other uh, vets, I like to see the real picture because on the real picture, you can really count the puppies. And then, you know, when she's giving birth, there will be, I say 11 puppies. So when she stops at number six, okay, then, you know, you have to get in to work. But if she has 11 puppies and she stops at 10, then oxytocin can do the work for you. Yeah. So I think it's also important not to overfeed a pregnant bitch because I see the tendency of lots of breeders who want, oh, she's pregnant, she has to eat. No, she doesn't. You don't want her to have too much weight on the puppies then make a C-section because they are not nice puppies, but really pigs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I don't I don't really increase the amount I feed my bitches, but I increase the quality of what yeah. I give them. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good and, idea. Yeah, I and um I must admit that I don't give them. I never feed my bitches puppy food ever, not even when they're feeding. I I just add in quality food um, and slightly reduce their ordinary food so they may have you know pilchards and eggs and cottage cheese things like that. yeah anybody else got any tips on a healthy pregnancy i feed puppy food from seven weeks yeah so do i i do too <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i'm glad i'm glad you said about x-raying natalie because that's something that i struggle with um i always have a tendency to think that there's still a puppy inside Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, it turns out just to be the uterus that I can yeah. still feel. Yeah, um, but occasionally, I've had a dead puppy appear hours later, and I thought, and you, then you think, oh God, if I had known, I could maybe have got yeah. to the dot that out. So I think next time I, I will go for an X-ray. Mm -hmm. I think also it's much more stress for the bitch to go when she has been whelping, and then you're thinking, oh, is there some or is there not? Then you yeah. have to rush to the vet, take much more stress because you leave the puppies behind at home. And those... and, and, and they can feel your stress as well. Yes, <laughs> it is. And there is no stress on day 55. You're coming at a moment that it's not too busy at the clinic. So yeah. we we'll really take care of those bitches to have no stress. The owner is with her and it's one picture. I have some people all uh, killing me uh, with the comments that you shouldn't do an x-ray on a pregnant bitch. You know, they did that on humans too before. So just to measure if the, the baby could pass the pelvic. So no, it's no stress and it's really a useful tool. Mm. Thank except, you. Except that in the UK, it is not permitted for the owner to be present during an x-ray. Ah, uh, that's a shame. Radiation protection laws forbid it. 
Yeah, here, here not. That's uh, an advantage we have. But even if you have your veterinary nurse and yeah. taking a bit of care and just not being like half an hour away with that bitch, you could, it's, it takes five minutes. The person could be in the waiting room and five minutes later having their dog again. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So Natalie, center stage again, <laughs> thoughts about AI. <laughs> oh, we should never do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, um, yes, of course you should do AI. And it's like I said already with the stud dogs, it's positive for knowing the semen quality before you bring it in. And there are, the positive is uh, also that you have the fertility check. You don't have the sometimes abuse of the bitch or the dog uh, while mating. Sometimes I've have seen very weird situations that you don't really need or the disappointment if the bitch is empty not knowing what is the factor is it the bitch is it the boy what do it what is it mm -hmm. also um this the the world has become a small place now because we have chilled semen we have frozen semen so we don't have to stay with our neighbor dog we can go around the world to have new lines in our breedings, new qualities, genetic diversification. Yeah. And there are lots of techniques. Uh, there you see the technique we use in our clinic, that's the TCI. But you can also have the simple intravaginal insemination, where you put the bitch like this afterwards for 30 minutes. Um, it's a good way to, to work in some cases. Um, I know they use a lot of uh, the Norwegian rigid catheter and I personally hate it. I've learned how to do it in Paris and I will never, never do that on a bitch because the risk of perforating her and you have to tell me if you have a, a, a Labrador or a golden retriever who has quite a heavy belly and then feel the cervix through that belly, I don't believe in it. I've done it in small uh, breeds and yes, then you can really feel where you are, but no, it's too risky. Mm -hmm. And the advantage we have with the TCA is an endoscope a camera, which provides you visual where you are, never having a chance to perforate. The bitch, like you see there, that's my own bitch on the table. Only it's a veterinary mean. nurse is uh, holding her in a way that she's just even watching the screen, no stress. <laughs> yes, she's just watching it. And every dog, I've seen Malinois, I've seen Bouvier, I've seen every breed. And sometimes they are like crazy on the ground and they, you put them on the table with their owner with them and they are standing still. So I've read in literature that you need to sedate for TCI. I've actually only sedated once a bitch for a TCI and all the others I've never done. Yeah. And I'm actually also sure that I shouldn't have not done that one bitch, but the owner was so sure she would be crazy and bite us. And she would not. Yeah. Natalie, do you ever have a problem with uh, doing TCI um, with the bitch's anatomy where you've just not been yes. able to get in? Yes, the golden retriever is a bitch to have. <laughs> Yeah. Because, yes, some golden retrievers, here you have the image where the catheter is really nicely into the uh, cervix, and that's the entry for the uterus. And there are some golden retrievers where you just can't get in that small hole. Yeah. Uh, because anatomy is it's coming not straight to you. Sometimes yeah. it's on the side. And remember, you have a scope that is like 30 centimeters that's long, mm -hmm. straight. And you have to go with a straighting to something that is not pointing to you. Mm -hmm. There are some tricks that you can use, and we have insufflating. And but really, I think one percent of the cases you can't get it get in, and that are the only cases, like for frozen semen, where you would switch to a surgical insemination instead of doing the TCI. Yeah. In the countries where you can do it, because I hate surgical inseminations. We, we can't do it here. Yeah, uh, In Europe, there's some countries like in Belgium, you can still do it.
but I really hate it because yeah. it's only uh, you don't operate on a pitch, I think. Yeah. to don't open her sedate her and do all those things just to get her pregnant yeah it's too invasive yeah sure. it's too invasive while you have this great technique where yeah. you do exactly the same but some old breeders just still continue on asking for those uh yeah. surgicals and we don't do it unless it's really necessary unless we can't get in and actually only oh. once well, I have one bitch that two different uh, reproductive vets have failed to do a TCI with the um, endoscope and what have you because of her anatomy. And mm -hmm. the second one managed to get in with um, a Norwegian and she got in whelp. So, I know you're sure because with the Norwegian, you don't see anything. No, so she, she, um, she's very experienced, the person that did it. And she did, she was holding the abdomen and feeling and mm. she said to me when she thought it was going through the, the cervix. Mm. Um, she's quite a slim fit bitch, so maybe she could feel it, I don't know. But anyway, mm. she was she was pregnant. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, but she could have been pregnant if it was just intravaginal. And well, you were the, first lucky. Vet, the first vet tried that and she didn't get in there. Yeah. yeah. I think she's just made funny. <laughs> yeah, but there is, and the Golden Retriever is number one in made funnies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have two of them, I think. <laughs> yeah, I have one myself also, where I also uh, swear to God I will not mate her again. But still, it's yeah. uh, it's possible, and we see differences in the days. Sometimes they come one day we can't get in, and the second day we can get in because mm -hmm. we normally tend to do twice an insemination. Right. Huh? um yeah any questions no is it, would you would you do an insemination on the first pregnancy yes because if we use a dog from abroad and it's thousand kilometers further yes i would you would yeah. yeah yeah interesting i know in some countries they don't allow it yeah I, they want I, a maiden I, bitch to to be bred from normally so I, i'm not sure what the rules are here they mm. they didn't used to allow it but they do now yeah, yeah. and with covid it's been almost a, a normal practice to have all inseminations yeah. because we can't go abroad anymore we can't we even had a rule here in belgium from our kennel club that you could not drive to the mating to the stud dog but you could drive to the veterinarian so Chill boxes came from everywhere, even from, <laughs> let us almost say, the town next to us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a good thing for breeders to learn to know how it exists and how it works. And here you see on the picture also uh, a picture of our sperm bank. So that's uh, frozen semen with uh, liquid nitrogen coming uh, out in vapor and the shipper who goes around the world. Mm -hmm. So, and that TCI is a perfect thing for it because you have more chances. They actually made some studies that you have a, a bigger litter and more chances on pregnancy with a TCA than a norm natural mating. Okay. And is that with chilled or frozen sperm? Uh, I would never do uh, it. If you compare it with the natural mating, it will never be frozen sperm. It's a... Yeah. Uh, it's taking chilled with chilled and fresh with fresh that they make the difference. Yeah, so we even have some breeders who have experienced themselves and who have their own stud dog and they come for an extra TCI after a mating and they see bigger litters. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So goldens um, appear to have reasonably good reproductive health. Are there any problems that you see um, in your golden bit, in the golden bitches that you see in practice, and any tips about managing the pregnant bitch? Um, what we see, we tend to see if you have a big litter, we see more and more the uterus atony that they don't start their whelping. That's the problem we see more often. So when we have we have had some uh, extreme cases here in the clinic where they had 17 and 18 puppies 
Oh, wow. So in those cases, we decide to do a C-section right away on day 63 after ovulation because we've seen too many cases where the uterus can't bear that weight mm. and the muscle doesn't start working. Yeah. So we don't let those bitches go over you. Never. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I tend to say what we see also a lot, and that was what Fiona also told, is why do we see more often those small litters in golden retrievers? I don't have a reason why, but is that because too much inbreeding or what? I don't know. We've seen uh, litters of two, three more often than we saw 10 years ago in goldens. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know why. Do you have any ideas? I don't know why, but it's certainly the case with some of my own. I mean, the last, last two litters, no problem at all. But before that, I had a bitch that had, I think she had eight in her first litter. Then she had four, one of which was born dead and I couldn't get back. And then she had five. Yeah. Now, I don't understand why her fertility, they were all natural matings. I have no idea why her fertility um, Fine. like that. Yeah. The only yeah. thing I've had a problem with, I've had two bitches that as maidens uh, flatly refused to be mated. And they were progesterone tested. They were spot on two days after um, ovulation and they wouldn't let the dog anywhere near them. Yeah. Um, and then both of them were taken to a different dog and they both got pregnant and they both stood for the mating. It was like they just didn't like the dog. <laughs> they have preferences. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I once was with the stud dog owner and I was... Um, hesitating between father and son and at a certain point I say okay I'll take the son and my bitch just um, jumped over the fence and went to go for the father because she liked him more and she didn't <laughs> want any matings to do with the son <laughs> she preferred a more experienced mature mom I think I think <laughs> so yes they have preferences sadly yeah yeah. So uh, do you see many with um, excess fetal fluids, you know, high drops? Mm, that's, but goldens, me not. Do you, Anne? No, not seen it, ever seen it in goldens. Okay. No. No. I've only ever seen it in a boxer. Bulldog, I think, that's what I've seen it in. Yeah. It's a phallic anyway, I can't remember whether it was a bulldog or a French bulldog. It was a mm. boxer I saw it in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and any tips for a, a, a healthy whelping, apart from keeping the puppies not too enormous? Well, I like to keep my bitches as fit as possible during the pregnancy. Yeah. They have perfectly normal exercise, um, often and everything for the first six weeks. And after that, I go by what they want. Mm -hmm. um, I find that some of them get a bit precious around week seven and they just walk beside me. Um, but some of them, you know, rush about until they're seven and a half weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I just keep an eye on them and don't let them do anything too stupid. I don't let mine swim um, once they're pregnant. And I don't know whether that is just me being a bit precious because I did once have one bitch took off on the beach and went into the sea swimming in February and she was six weeks pregnant. And she still managed to have nine puppies perfectly happily. Um, but I just worry about infection because our yeah. local builders are not exactly crystal clear. Mm. Okay. Yes, but I don't think the sea is such a bad thing. What I don't yeah. like them to do is swim in a pool where it's yeah. really dirty water yeah. while the cervix is yeah. not closed yet. But yeah. when they are six weeks in pre pregnancy, the, the cervix is closed enough so she yeah. could. Yeah. yeah. Now, I've seen a bitch uh, um, who lost uh, half of her litter because she was swimming in a dirty pool. Yeah. So that's a shame. That's yeah. a... Well, as I say, I tend to be a bit overcautious about that sort of thing. Once mm -hmm. they're pregnant, I tend to try and keep them out of... Well, I've, as I say, I've got this one that likes to lie in muddy puddles, and I really don't like her doing that no. when she's pregnant. No, that I would avoid also. <laughs> you and you anything to add? No, I've got nothing to add to that. I, I would go along with uh, what the other ladies have said. But I'd also say that I don't want them to be stressed. I try yeah. not to go away, so yeah. they're not. You know, there's not a stranger in the house looking after them. Um, I, I don't take them out on unnecessary car journeys. I tend to to walk them from home rather than drive anywhere with them. Mm -hmm. 
I move, I put the whirlpool box up in loads of time and I have them sleeping uh, in the room with the whirlpool box a good week before I expect them to give birth. Mm -hmm. uh, just so that there's no sudden stresses or anything like this. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't scan for that reason either. I just palpate at three to four weeks. Um, I just want to know they're pregnant. At that point, I'm not worried about numbers, but I do think that the later x-ray is the way to go. That's why we, when we scan ultrasound, yeah. we don't put those bitches on their backs. They just stand yeah. on the table and I'm going under them like this. Yeah. It's much less stress for the bitch than being forced on her back, hold on a cushion. No, yeah. that's how I scan as well, with the bitch standing on the table. Yeah. yeah, and even with small French bulldogs, I managed to put the scan underneath. Yeah. It's always possible. Occasionally, I have to ask the owner to lift the dog up by the front legs. Yeah, if it's a very yeah. low dog, but I never roll them over or put them on their sides when I'm scanning. Yeah. Me neither. I have some uh, thing to add on the whelping because yeah. I see my clients a lot that they want that bitch in that whelping box and stay, stay, stay there. I have, I tend to walk a lot with my dogs when they are in whelping. So we are actually walking around in the garden or in the house while they are giving birth. I have, I see that more bitches, the, um, the bird is going more uh, fluent when the bitch is walking around and moving. So every time I have a client calling me, it stopped. I always say, start moving your bitch. How many puppies are born in the car driving to the vet? Because they are started moving, preparing everything, and then ah, all of a sudden the puppy is there. Yeah, that, that's probably, um, there's lots of things, isn't there? It, the muscle activity helps with mm -hmm. calcium metabolism. So I think it's really, really important to allow them to, to move and, as you say, often if you just take them outside for a wee during the procedure, yeah. then they'll have another puppy because they've been moving into different positions and the muscle activity and things. I've had bitches go outside and have a wee, and then as they stand up, the puppy yeah. comes. <laughs> yeah. Always, Always go, go outside with a towel. With a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Always go out with them with a towel in your hand. <laughs> a towel and a torch. There was a bit right. But I we do our cell phones now. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know somebody who actually ended up having two puppies delivered in a lay-by on the A47 on the way to the vet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, in humans, of course, they, they definitely encourage you to move around. And there's a lot more um, talked about that nowadays, I think, with, with birthing plans and things like that. Yeah. So um, how to, to care for your bitch once she's had the puppies and any common problems and how to avoid them? I think you have to think about mastitis and the picture is so great. I think, Anne, you gave that, no? No. <laughs> no, okay. No, no, um, it was uh, somebody that I know's bitch that uh, yeah. he actually sent me the picture a long time ago. It's horrible. It's really horrible when you see that. And most people call us, the bitch has fever and doesn't want to eat. And we've palpated and there is nothing wrong with the mammae, with the, with the nipples and the breasts. But this comes afterwards. Yeah. So from the moment she has a fever and doesn't want to eat, it's either a, something in the uterus is going wrong or something in the... Mammary gland. Or, a, or a mastitis. And my experience, 90% it's mastitis. Yeah. So cold showers is the first thing I recommend. Don't stop, don't wait until you feel a hard tick place in the mamai. Start showering, cold showers to have more of the um, vasoconstriction. So the, um, the vessels are going open and closed, open and closed. G drain it and let the puppies drink from that uh, yeah, mamai. It gets empty. Uh, only if it's really clear pus and it's uh, very badly infected, then you should wean the puppies. But most of the cases, you can keep the puppies on it. If it gets worse, you will feel a hard mass and it will erupt like this, like a big abscess blown open. And I'm sometimes amazed because one of my bitches had this 
um, when the puppies were one week and a half, I couldn't really wean them and she took care of them so good. She had 40 degrees uh, Celsius, mm -hmm. so that's very high fever, but she continued to take care of her puppies uh, so preciously. And we can only give something against pain for the mothers, but be aware that every NSI day, every painkiller you give goes through the puppies in the milk and then giving them more chances on liver and kidney problems later on life. So don't take too fast medications, but she needs something against the pain, of course, and something to drop the fever. Mm. But, and the antibiotics that you use on these cases, you use antibiotics that are safe for the puppies, like amoxicillin clavulanic. Yeah, yeah. I find that um, what you feed your bitch makes a difference to the thickness of the milk. And I, I, again, I don't feed puppy food to my bitches. I, I mm -hmm. just enrich their diet and make sure that they get plenty of fluids with it because I think that helps to keep the milk actually flowing. If it gets too thick, I think that's a, a precursor to this. You know? Yeah, but one individual has more chance to create it than the other. I had two, at the time, I had two bitches with puppies, I think some days between. They ate the same, they did the same. So yeah. one individual has it more often than the others. And they have proven that probiotics help. Mm. So if you have a bitch who has had mastitis before, it's worth trying to give her uh, probiotics yeah. while she is in the end of her uh, pregnancy already. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great tip. Mm -hmm. So, checking your puppies yeah. with congenital problems and what to do with them, normal early developments and tips for rearing puppies. Anne, I think this is one of your interests, isn't it? Well, check, checking the puppies is vital. I always check for cleft palate. I have to say, in all the years that I've had in breeding, I've only ever had one, but uh, it's, it's always something to check for. The other common thing we see in uh, puppies is ectopic ureter, where the puppies are wet. Uh, mm. You don't normally pick that up until the puppies are about five days old. Um, and in some cases, it can be a lot later. Depends on a little bit on the mothering. If you've got an over-attentive bitch, you may not see that the puppy is wet until it's three or four weeks old and up on its feet and the bitch isn't there all the time. Um, my personal feeling about cleft palate puppies is I do euthanize them. Um, I always think it's a possible indication of other midline defects. I've never post-mortem them to see, but they are a nightmare to rear. You have to tube feed them because otherwise the milk goes down their noses, you risk them getting inhalation pneumonia. You then have to feed them on little soft nuggets of food when they're a bit bigger so that they can swallow them. It doesn't go up into their noses. Uh, they need surgical correction at some point, which is very, very successful. Um, and I just think that this is a puppy that wasn't meant to be. We've had a couple of wet puppies, um, but the current um, treatment, if they're suitable, of laser therapy is so non-invasive, so quick and easy, that I have treated both of my wet puppies or had them treated um, and very successfully. And, and certainly uh, these days I would, I would do that. Um, the, the other thing is, and let me just go and shut the door because my dog think it's way past dinner time. I can't <laughs> think with them barking at me. Fiona, what do you do with your puppies? Yeah. Um, check that the eyes are closed, that the ears are closed, because if they're open, it tends to go hand in hand with some other um, abnormality. Um, cleft palate, I would put to sleep if I had a cleft palate. I haven't had that many. Um, but one thing that I now, having had, having experienced it a couple of years ago, I always check for an imperforate anus. Mm. Um, the funny thing is, I'd only ever seen it once before. I had a little um, Pomeranian cross as a child who had a litter of puppies and one was born without an anus. Um, and I haven't seen it since 
all those years ago, but one of my golden retriever puppies two years ago was born without an anus. My vet said that it's quite common in lambs and that sometimes you can, um, that it, you can create an opening, um, not surgically, unfortunately, that size, but um, he yeah. offered to have a go and to my regret, I let him um, and it, it died after 24 hours. And I think now if I had a puppy without an anus again, hope I never do, but if I did, I would just put it to sleep straight away. Yeah. Um, I think it's likely that when you have that kind of deformity that there's probably something else wrong inside as well anyway. Mm, so yeah. it's pointless putting them through the discomfort. Mm. Um, so yeah, they're the main things I check for. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have anything else to add to? Oh, and weights. Yes, of course. Yes, buy them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's you can talk an awful lot about normal early development and tips for rearing puppies. I mean, there's a lot of information out there um, yeah. on the internet that's very good. I do think it's absolutely critical. It's not just the temperament of the bitch and the way the bitch is treated throughout the pregnancy that influences the puppy's temperaments. It's mm. the way you handle them. And mm. I start handling mine from three days old. Yeah. I pick them up. I stroke them with a baby hairbrush. I tickle their feet. I roll mm. them on their backs gently. I put them back with the mother. And I do that once a day for the, from about three days old to about two weeks old. I start um, a sound CD as soon as their ears are open. Um, mm -hmm. Once their eyes start opening, they have different toys at different times in the welcome box, things for them to interact with, climb over, that sort of thing. I have a lot of interactive toys when they get a bit bigger, um, like the tunnel is that is one of mine. They seem to love that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got uh, a ball pit and I've got uh, like that. Which they just think is the greatest thing. Uh, things like different surfaces for them to walk on. So I have vet bed on the floor. They go out onto a concrete run. When they're a bit bigger, I put the puppy pen out on the grass and they go out on the grass. They're born in the living room, which has a laminate floor. And there's a very tatty old rug that I dig out when they're um, little. And then when I clean the whelping box out, I put the tatty old rug on the floor and sit them on that. Doesn't matter if they pee on it. Um, while I clean out the welcome box and then I pop them back in the box. So I'm trying to get them on as many surfaces as possible. Um, I've got lots of other dogs and they will um, come up to the wire and speak to the, the puppies through the wire. Um, I vacuum inside the pen sometimes and that seems to be great fun. They always attack the vacuum cleaner when they're young. Uh, just lots and lots of different things, lots of different stimulation for the puppies. You're basically following the puppy plan, aren't you? Basically, I follow the puppy plan. The only thing I don't do is I don't... You haven't gone and got a cat, though. Hmm? You haven't gone out specifically to get a cat, have you? No, I haven't got a cat because okay. I live about 20 yards from the forest across a busy road, and my cat will be over my fence and getting hit by a car. <laughs> yeah. I, I get through cats like nobody's business. Um, the only thing I don't do that the puppy plan suggests is... I don't feed them out of casserole dishes and saucepans and stuff because I do not think it's a good idea to teach golden retrievers that these things contain food. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have enough problems with counter surface anyway. Um, I had somebody visiting the puppies um, last summer and I had left something simmering on the stove. Oh. And I thought, that's funny. I can smell something. And I went through and it was boiling and the puppy that the, one of the dogs had jumped up and put their foot on the um, on the hob and turned the knob up well it's not a knob it's a you know a finger touch mm -hmm. thing it's an induction knob um, and if I hadn't gone and checked my soup would have been boiled away to nothing <laughs> so um, I don't teach them the pans and casserole dishes and not to food, food. But, but yes, I, but I try and stimulate them as much as possible. And, and in lots of different situations. Yeah, in and I take them out and I feed them separately. Um, they can see the other puppies, but they're outside the pen. They get their food bowl separately. Um, and I rotate which puppy I do that with. Yeah. Uh, they, of course, they go out in the car when they're about seven weeks because they go to have their eyes screened. Yeah. Uh, and if 
I've got time or whatever is suitable, I will actually take one or two of them out and put them in the back of the car um, and just leave them in the caged in section uh, with the boot open facing the road so that they see traffic. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So I do loads and loads of stuff with them. And the feedback I get, people can't believe that they just walk into their new homes and, and are relaxed and everything. And yeah. I'm sure it's because I put so much into them. Yeah. Yes, the in the enriched environment for puppies is very important. Very. I think it's vital. I think it, it fixes their temperament for later on. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked earlier about um, starting puppy training, toilet training off very early on with um, using things like puppy pads and then progressing on to litter trays. Mm -hmm. um, I put the well, I have a blanket in my whelping box that doesn't fill the whole box. Yeah puppy pads or um, incontinence pads are on the edge and from about two and a half weeks they walk off and go on the pad yeah and then yeah. when I move them because they then get moved out of my living room and into my dog room I then have a litter tray and I start off by putting the puppy pads in the tray and putting cat litter on the top and once they get the idea that they're transitioning from the pads to the cat litter I then remove the pads yeah. I work also with something sorry Natalie go on uh, I say I work also with something similar. You can see at a moment that the that the puppies start going to one side of the litter box to go and pee or something. That's yeah. when I clear a bit of the um, carpet or the vent bed, and I put a very low scale uh, for boots to let leak the boots out. That's only one centimeter yeah. high. I put some uh, litter um, material for cats, yeah. and I put the puppies on top of on it. And they are so quickly trained to go on it. And when they get bigger, the, the surface where I put it in, the litter box is getting bigger. So that's perfect to learn them to train uh, being clean. Yeah. yeah. I think if they're given the opportunity, they, they become inhibited about being dirty very early yeah. on. And those yeah. puppies go home so easy to house train. Yeah. 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 Would you then get the, the new new puppy owner to carry on with a litter tray and then move that out or do you know you don't, I don't normally no. I mean, my puppies also have access to the outside when yeah. I'm there because I have a, a dog flap in the in my dog room and a ramp so mm. that they they've got um they don't have to go down steps or anything, they just go down the ramp, um up the ramp and down the ramp. And uh, they go outside onto the concrete and by the time they leave me they're pretty well voluntarily going outside. Yeah. I haven't tried a, a litter tray, but I use a piece of AstroTurf. Oh yeah. I, have, I found that really useful. Um, you can put a pad underneath it to catch the pee as it goes down yeah. through it. Oh, yeah. uh, I can get a piece of AstroTurf that cut it to the size of the, the gravel tray that I use and, um, yeah. and it would catch it like that. Mm. Yeah, because I buy those great big trays that you buy for going in greenhouses that you fill with gravel and put your plant pots on. Yeah. They're only about a centimetre and a half, two centimetres high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that works really well. Yeah. Do the puppies ever try and eat the litter? Very rarely. Yeah. But I always use the compressed, um, the wood pellets. And it's yeah. just a load of dust, so they don't bother. Yeah. Yes, I've tried several um, materials, and I used to use one uh, formed from clay. And if the mother ate it or the puppies ate it, it could not bother them. But I like the wood pellets a lot because you have less dust in the house. Yeah. And if you start early enough, they don't, they are not interested in eating them because first they have the litter box and afterwards they learn to eat their kiblings. So yeah. they don't mix up. Yeah. And the, the smell with the wood uh, Pellet. uh, pellets is much better than with other litter boxes. <laughs> I used to use um, wood shavings, uh, dust extraction yeah. wood shavings they used for horses, but it was burning out my vacuum cleaner and it was getting tracked through the house because yeah. at a certain point, the bitch no longer spends hours with the puppies and she'd jump out of the pen and it would be all over her tail and trousers. Yeah. yeah. And it got spread everywhere. And the day that I threw the sheets back to change the bed and found... <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to try something else. <laughs> Well, I, I think um, that that was absolutely fabulous, ladies, and I, I hope that everybody has got a lot out of it. 
Um, I'd like to thank everybody for checking in today and um, a special thanks for Anna and Ricardo for helping us once again with all the IT tech and everything and the, the management. Um, we're going to open the questions now. Um, so if you do have any, any questions that you want to ask, um, we can... Um, and it's already open, so people can write directly to, to everyone and not to the moderator now. Yeah, okay. So, so if you've got any questions, if you, if you want to type in now. Okay, so... I come from a breed where a 20% plus percentage COI isn't that special. Where's it gone? And an equally popular breed is the golden. I started with the golden retriever now at three months of age and my puppy's now five months. I'm surprised on how the COI needs to be as low as possible what about doubling your type of golden? If you are doing an outcross, are you sure her type is going to be reproduced in her puppies? Our bitches can have limited amount of litters. Do you want to waste it to try an outcross? I, I, think, the, I think we can put that to the panel, but one thing I would say is, is that there's two things to consider very carefully. One is um, genotype, which is your line breeding for genetics. The other is phenotype which is, is breeding for type. So you are, when you do consider um, these kind of outcross matings, I, I think you have to have a really good eye for, for the phenotype of what you're putting together. But um, I'll hand that over to our panel and see if anybody's got anything else that they'd like to add. Well, I think so. The studies being done that suggest that if your COI is over 10% and certainly over 12.5%, you start to lose the size, you start to get fertility problems, and you start to lose your longevity. Yeah, that is. And can I add, if you do the type of breeding, that you should not only look at the stud dog, but also his parents, his grandparents. You have to see a type there. It's not only, oh, I like that stud dog and he likes, it's the same type he is. I want to see his whole pedigree fixing, my, uh, being the type I like that I'm searching for. Yeah, no, absolutely. It goes a long way back in the pedigree that, doesn't it? And I think that, having a really good eye for the grandparents in uh, when I've done out crosses that seems to be absolutely crucial is is that you get those the parents and the grandparents but I would also um, want to look at the offspring yeah some dogs do not stamp their type on their offspring yeah so I'm looking for his type and his puppies look more like their mother's then that's not what I want. I want a dog that's stamping that type on his offspring. Yes, but you also have to consider what your bitch line does. Of course, of course. It's because your bitch line can be very strong on her type also. Yep, exactly. But I'm talking about looking at several different mm -hmm. offspring, presumably mm -hmm. different bitches. Yeah. This is, this is where we miss the show so much because this is where you get to see yeah. them and prepare them. Yeah. Absolutely, Anne. Yeah. So from Loyal Gold, who's FCI. Hello, I was wondering if you had a situation in which one female could not have puppies with one male, in between have puppies with another male, and the male who she was empty to four times also had litters with other females, but the two wouldn't go together and wouldn't give pups with natural mating and with AI, yes. nor from the one with the endoscope. I'm not sure if I call it you you had such if you had such a pair did you try to make them again after these litters and did it work later on or is there anything you can do to make such a combination work or is it just nature telling us that it's not a good idea something nature is telling us it's not a good idea I have seen such cases where I actually say it's not a match to be made uh, if you have tried even with uh, intrauterine and you have done all the tests up and everything is okay and she's getting pregnant from another boy, it's because it's not made to be. Maybe there are some difficulties with the genes. Maybe she has early resorption because of the genes not fixing, uh, not matching it up each other. 
So yes, that's that's well, I've I seen that. Say, I would say I've seen that in my own because I had this one bitch that flatly refused to be mated the first time I took her. Um, completely with three of us, we just could not get a mating. The second, the next time she came in season, we went straight to the repro vet, had the semen checked and did an AI. She didn't get pregnant. The third time I took her to a completely different dog. She stood for him. We got a tie and she had nine puppies. So there was obviously something about the first dog that didn't yeah. match with her. And touch Do you think that, that, that your body is against certain sperm or... Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you hear stories of women that are allergic to their husband's sperm and can't get pregnant naturally. I suppose it can happen in um, in animals as well. I don't know. Thank you. So from Anne Falconer, how would you start? How early, how early would you start progesterone testing on a bitch that ovulated on day seven on a previous litter, especially as there may be an AI mating with frozen semen? Normally day five. I haven't seen them earlier than day five to be really, to not miss them. Yeah, I would say five as well. Yeah, right. But so, I would keep a very close eye on the bitch um, and swabbing her every day because sometimes they can show a little bit of colour without actually dripping and before they really uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's good advice, Anne, yeah. So from Karen Williams, thank you ladies, the most informative seminar yet. I have a PRA1 carrier and can trace this back at least seven generations in his pedigree. Practically how far back in a dog's pedigree should you go back looking for undesirable faults, e.g. bad hips or temperament, etc. Any thoughts, Fiona? Um, well, I know that when I'm looking at a dog's pedigree, if I know that there's been um, a cataract failure or a known bad temperament, even on the fifth or sixth or seventh generation, then I'm very aware of it and try not to double up on anything that might bring it forward. Um, I don't think it's really practical to go too much further back, um, but doing, um, doing a test mating on uh, canine data that throws up the five most influential dogs might be useful um, to see whether that dog crops up more than more than a couple of times in your pedigree. Um, but yeah, that's that's what yeah. I would do. Yeah, yeah. Paula, well, thanks to all. I'd like to ask Natalie, how easy is a dual mating to do if you wanted to use frozen semen and fresh? Is there anything which must must or must not be done at the time. It is possible, but you'd have to know if you use frozen semen, frozen semen only lasts for 24 hours because of the preparation you did with it. It's uh, not as long livity as uh, fresh semen. And we want to inseminate a bitch with frozen semen three days after ovulation. So that's really the end of the timing that you really want to be inseminating her. So if you have to put fresh semen afterwards, when would you do that? Then on the fourth day after ovulation, because you don't want to have the fresh semen who is much more active be before the frozen semen. So I would actually do then the third day, the frozen semen and the fourth day after ovulation, the fresh semen. And that's quite late then. Yeah. Yeah, thank but you. But to give uh, a head a head song for the frozen semen. From Sir, thank you so much for a most interesting chat. Many good points indeed. I have a question to the ladies. If they see lots of cases of um, if they see a lot of cases of vaginal septum, and what's your thought about that, Henrik? So well, this is I've a been involved with the EU project at Cambridge Vet School. And Laura Owen told me that every single bitch that they have diagnosed with ectopic, with a vaginal septum has had ectopic ureter. Oh, oh that's, hmm. that's interesting. Now, some of them don't have the septum and still have EU, but everyone they found with a septum has had EU. And she's thinking that it's part of the same developmental fault something to do with the malarian ducts that form the um, ureters, I guess. 
I must disagree because I've seen some septal uh, vaginal septums in lots of different breeds with no ectopic ureters. Ah, now I'm talking vertical septums here, not not strictures. I don't know. Vocal. I mean, yes. Yeah, she yeah. said. Yeah. We operate them, and they have no ectopic uh, ureters. Well, <laughs> that's what she told me. Yeah, no, but it's just my personal experience, yeah. and we've seen it in some uh, in different breeds. And what we were interested in is when they breed from a bridge, if the puppy girls would have it also. That is something we ask ourselves, if it goes through from generation to generation, which we could not prove yet. Okay. Well, that's something to consider that it may be a, a, a hereditary fault rather than just a gentle defect. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, Henry. I didn't mention it, but it is possible to have your bitch screened and your dog at Cambridge by ultrasound for the presence of ectopic ureters, because as you may or may not know, a lot of males never show symptoms because they're yeah. anatomically different, and yeah. a lot of bitches may not show up as a problem until, for example, after they're spayed. Yeah. Because if the um, misplaced ureter is high up in the urethra, it may still be within part of the sphincter, and it's only when you neuter them and you get post spay incontinence that you get leakage. Mm. But you, yeah, but you can do contrast study x-rays and, and prove it, and um, on yeah, ultrasound but, checks you would see it also, you don't see the jets. Ah, you do see, but you do see the jets because they use Doppler and they give the dog a frusamide tablet Mm -hmm. And you can do it with the, and with, certainly with golden retrievers that lying on their sides on the table with a skilled operator. And I have seen it in my own bitches because my bitches have all been screened. And yeah. you can measure how far from the, uh, yes. into the, the jet comes out. And you can grade them A as normal, B close, or C as ectopic. Yes, I know. That's why I say you can check it by yeah. ultrasound. Yeah. And it's much less invasive and of course it's much less dangerous because the contrast um, dyes that you use can cause anaphylactic reactions. It can, but it's in the cases where you want to see if you can go operate yes or not and then... Uh, they, they can do, at Cambridge their equipment is so good they can tell yeah. mm -hmm. whether they can do it or not, whether it's intramural or extramural. Yeah. Yeah, Laura Owen's been doing a lot of research, hasn't yeah, she? It's been yeah. very, very useful. And I think and you, take, that, you take your leaky 12 week old puppy in at nine o'clock in the morning and you pick it up at half past four and it's dry. Yeah, it's okay. perfect with a laser. With a laser. It's, it's brilliant. It's, well, one of mine brilliant. had to have propylene until she came in season, but once she was in season, it, it went away. But, um, but yeah, it was. It was amazing. And it's a fraction of the cost of having it done surgically. Yeah. Well, about yeah. half the cost. Yeah. Okay, so let's push on, Jana. Thank you for an interest. Would you, if you had a puppy in a litter who faded in the first week and it turned out it had a problem with the organs, would you be cautious about the rest of the litter, or is that something that just happens sometimes? I'd say it's something that just happens. I've I've had a a, a puppy with um internal plumbing problems shall we say um and the rest of the litter were fine um i don't think uh, it necessarily follows that the whole litter is affected if there's one that's got something i would agree development can go wrong in some puppies and not the whole litter has to be uh, affected yeah and i think it's one of the reasons why bitches tend to have so many puppies it allows for wastage yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. what would happen normally, isn't it? Um, you know. If you had one born with some sort of deformity, it wouldn't survive in, in nature. Yeah. Which so is one of the reasons why, why, reason why I would tend to not treat a cleft palate or, as, as Fiona says, not do an imperfect anus because it could actually have atresia. So there might not even be anything behind the anus. Yeah. 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 So uh, some thank yous from Ben and Fiona Thurm, uh, from Lindsay Wedge, um, from Diane. Gaiardia seems to be very common now. I hear other breeders having various failures with their regime. Interesting to hear a more specific regime from Natalie. 
Well, like I told you before, I'm also frustrated about the Hiardia. We've tried uh, with the Fenmendazol uh, five days. Uh, normally, we deworm our puppies on two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. But uh, five days Fenmendazol and the Hiardia is not gone. Always check if Isospora, the Coccidia, is not going along with it because that makes it even difficult, more difficult to treat it. In the university in Belgium, I know they are treating puppies from three months old with one month of Drontal because they don't get rid of it anymore with Panacur. They don't get rid of it with Metrodinazole. There is really getting some problems in, in, the, in getting rid of it. And you have to wash the puppy's rear ends, uh, hoping to diminish the contamination um, ammoniac uh, seems to help to clean the house or the litters with uh, the floorings with ammoniac, but I don't know by you, but I hate the smell of that. No. So it's a really a difficult one. And um, even if they are playing on the grass, you can forget, you can, will never ever get rid of it anymore. We, we had a couple of Giardia outbreaks in the rescue center that I ran and mm -hmm. um, we were struggling to get rid of it. And I contacted the guide dogs to the blind breeding center because mm -hmm. I knew that they had had problems in the past and their vet told me to treat all of the, all of the dogs on site for seven yes. days, not, not, not three or four, but seven no, no, days. No, everybody, yeah. yeah. And for seven days, which is more than the recommended amount um, to bleach, I quite like the smell of bleach, to bleach all hard surfaces and um, wash all bedding at a high temperature. But as far as our grass paddock was concerned, we had to rest it for six weeks until there had been, had been heavy rain to wash the oocysts right down into the soil. Yes, uh, but even the seven days we have done, seven days giving, seven days not giving, seven days giving. And yeah. even then we still had Chiardia and the bleach I used to do that also, and I let the people bleach their their uh, grass even. Go with the, 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 yeah, you know, the thing where you spread um, fluids. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, we bleach the grass, it grows back later. Uh, but a, a recent study told us that bleach doesn't help. And I actually use bleach a lot for it. So I'm still, I don't know what you say to Anne on the bleach. Well, I've always read that bleach works. Um, I have to admit that when I've got a problem, I've actually used Jay's fluid, but I've had Isospora once. Yeah. And this was in a puppy that had gone to stay with a friend. I was keeping two, and the friend offered to have them a week for a week each and swap them over. So they got used to being apart, which was great. And he'd imported a dog of a different breed from Scotland from someone who always had all sorts of issues with um, stomach upsets and he had a litter at the time and when I tested them they had coccidiosis mm -hmm. and um, I reckon my puppy picked it up there. Here in Europe we see it more and more and the combination with um, Giardia and Isospora makes it a really difficult one to get rid of. Yeah. But for Isospora you have the Procox and that works very nicely, but still the Giardia is the difficult one to get rid of then. Yeah. So Okay, so if we can move on um, uh, and from Liz, in regards to vaccination, Natalie, you recommended a full booster in preparation for mating a bitch. Would you still do this if you were going to mate her on two consecutive years? Yes. Yeah. I want uh, antibodies as high as possible in the milk for the puppies and for the colostrum to really be rich in, uh, in antibodies. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, from David, they said, there's been another fantastic session. Thanks for, for allowing me to join as a golden retriever imposter once again. It was really heartening to hear Anne, Fiona and Natalie making the comment that breeders shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater when breeding with respect to health issues, being involved in various other breeds I've seen some breeders lose their way by becoming so focused on trying to get a zero hip score and discarding so many other positive breed attributes along the way. It's so important to look at the whole dog. Interestingly, our Weimaraners, we have produced naught or one hip scoring offspring 
which had been made up into championships, champions from parentage in the mid-teens who were also made up to champions. So yeah, I mean, hips doesn't have any relation to the champion, does it? But um, yeah, it, it, that, this is the very typical of what I was saying before about possibly doing some greater analysis about hip scores and, and you know, if you've got parents in the teens and you're producing naught and one hips, um, maybe we're missing a slightly bigger picture somewhere anyway. Um, I think that that's fine, David, thank you. So from Mikhail to everybody, love this session, thanks very much. What about genetic testing laboratories like Embark who test all markers for a disease in the breeze of every sample sent? and then, then any new markers they present. We did actually touch on that, didn't we, in our, in our conversation. So I think we'll just move on because there's quite a lot of messages. But um, yeah, I, I think it, it's probably not a bad thing to s survey breeds and see what is turning up. Um, and as we said before, it's sometimes cheaper to do it that way. Um, from Maylene, thank you, very informative. Um, Arlene, Arlene, what is your advice to a new owner and possible breeder? So I think we, we've covered lots of advice there, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. I recognize all the things you all three tell about breeding. I love the informative about breeding and also from the three of you. It'd be helpful when we could get a database like Sweden for all the reports of our abnormalities or diseases that are within our lovely breed, thank you. So yeah, Ellen, I, I agree um, that a database, a, an, an international database might be useful, mightn't it now? Yeah. Yeah. International, <laughs> that is the problem we have with all those databases. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, we've covered herpes virus, is there a wrong time to vaccinate? The data sheet says during estrus or seven to 10 days after mating and one to two weeks prior to whelping. I tend to do it always around the day of uh, insemination because yeah. we've used the herpes vaccination when there was no stock at all. And we had to be very cautious not to use it to bitches who didn't ovulate so I tend to use it only when I'm sure she will be mated. Yeah. So in the first week she is mated, knowing, uh, and then one week on day 55, when they come in for the x-ray, we give the second injection. That's nicely one week before the, the birth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the lady that we asked, asked the question about um, a combination not working said that actually the, the, she owns the dog and the bitch and they love each other. And they're all re always ready to mate, but it just doesn't work. I don't think there's any advice from that. Mm -hmm. um, from Angie, well done, Midland Golden, Penny and Anna, a big thank you, Natalie, Fiona and Anne for giving your time and expertise to help everybody. Another one from Mary, thank you ladies. Miriam, very interesting. Um, and especially the part on AI and the right moment of insemination. I have to send chill semen to a country 10 hours away actually somewhere around the end of this week. My clinic wants to collect the semen as soon as the bitch is ovulating and the ship it the same day. Theoretically, is it the next, it, theoretically then it's is the next day on the country of destination. What if there is a delay of a day? Are we way too late then, say three, three to four days after ovulating? No, we are not too late, but because I must say that we had some problems in the last week with all couriers, TNT, FedEx, DHL, having problems to deliver within 24 hours. And I agree that the day that the bitch is ovulating is the day that you should send it. The semen stays good in the box for 48 hours. It has to arrive on its destination in that 48 hours but it can be used for four days to be comfortable. And like I said, with frozen semen, we use it at the actually last days of the, the, the conception. So being at the third and fourth day after ovulation, 
is not so bad. It would be the same with the frozen semen. So as long as it's a good quality, don't be afraid. And we tend to have a, the problem with the couriers, so we tend to send it a bit earlier. Last week also, we said, send it on Wednesday, please. So if they are too late, Friday it's still is at our clinic because the most of the couriers don't work in the weekends. So if you send on uh, Thursday, then the next day is Friday. If it doesn't come in, it comes in the Monday, too late and then it's dead because it has been staying in the box more than 48 hours. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's great. And I understand at the moment there are some problems getting semen from the UK to Europe and vice versa because of Brexit. Yes. <laughs> so you're okay within Europe, but I wouldn't risk chills at the moment until they get themselves sorted out. Yeah, it's a problem. Um, for the moment, we have more frozen semen going up and down with the Brexit than chilled semen. Yeah. But I hope that will get better again and we try to, to find some ways to get chilled again in the, in the UK. So Diane wants to hear some more about EBVs from Anne on another occasion. So I think you can probably speak to each other. <laughs> <laughs> from Marikel on COI, what number of generation is standard, Anne? Well, some people will tell you as many as possible, but I really think that 10 generations complete is probably accurate enough. As yes. several people have mentioned, um, if you were in Golden's canine data, and I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying canine data do three different levels and they will also tell you what the most influential dogs in the pedigree are. Yeah. So that could be quite useful. Yes, yeah, they look at a five generation, a 10 generation right. and everything up more than 10 generation, you always have higher coefficients. Of course, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, from Petra, thank you for an interesting afternoon. In regards of herpes, can it cause abortion later in pregnancy? It can cause failure to conceive, it can cause reabsorption, and it can cause premature stillbirth. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Diane, great question about fresh and frozen semen from Zampanza. Hello, everybody, as a breeder and also a veterinarian, what point of health of Golden Retriever do you consider the most important? you see in the clinic and perhaps we do not give enough attention to? Atopic dermatitis, where is no test is available. Yeah. The yeah, skin diseases. Good. The problem with atopic dermatitis is that although only 10% of the dog population in general is affected by atopy, if you use an affected dog, 40% of the offspring will be affected. Yes. So is it a, do a dominant? Is it a dominant gene then, Anne? Or no, the, but there must be some genetic component which we have not yet identified. Mm. Um, and basically, my advice would be: if you've got an atopic dog, do not breed from it. Yes, because that basically means if you've got ten puppies, four of them will be atopic. Yeah, and it's a and nightmare to deal with. It's a incurable disease. It requires multimodal treatment. It can be extremely expensive to treat and you can get breakdowns, particularly at times of high pollen and so forth. So the owner thinks they're toddling along nicely and you've got it under control. And then you come to May and all the trees are in flower and all of a sudden the dogs yes, again. I think also it's the most expensive thing you can have. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a real problem. I mean, yes, we see a lot of cancer, um, and I would have said a few years ago, elbow dysplasia, but actually I would say we see 10 times as much elbow dysplasia in Labradors as we do in gold yeah. disease days. Yeah, but we should take attention to it because we used to see it more in Labradors, but I have the, I see it more and more in Goldens too. And when I was studying at vet school as a young uh, student, I saw lots of Labradors and that's why I, um, uh, thought to do it on my own golden retrievers while it was not obliged in anywhere and nobody did it already but I think it's a good idea to keep on focusing on those elbows also yep 
Yeah. I think one of the things about elbow dysplasia is it is so painful. Yeah. It is much more difficult to manage the pain. And I have seen a Labrador that collapsed with a temperature of over 40 and a hugely swollen elbow when, when we knew it had um, elbow dysplasia and we knew it had severe uh, degenerative joint disease around both of its elbows, but all of a sudden one of the joints went septic. Mm. And that was um, hematogenous spread into the joint and the dog was very ill at one point point we thought we were going to have to put it to sleep because it was suffering so much but then the antibiotics kicked in and the pain we got the pain relief right and the dog recovered um but it didn't get better from its elbows but it didn't have that acute crisis but it is an excruciatingly painful condition yeah. i see mary is asking um about the heritability of of um elbow dysplasia compared to hip dysplasia yeah. um, i think I think it's a lot higher, but I can't give yeah. you a number without looking it up somewhere. Okay, that's what I was going to ask, whether you knew a figure. I don't know a figure, <laughs> but I do think it is definitely more in inherent. Yeah. Yes. I don't know a number too, but I also think it's very inherent. Yeah. And uh, what what's the best age to, to heart test from Liz? Are Over you 14 months. months. 14 months. Over 14 months. Yeah, I, I, don't, I normally do mine around 14 months. Yeah, a thank you from Christine Ashton, from Melissa. Christine, many thanks. Um, many years ago, I had a, a severely compromised puppy for various reasons, only weighing 3.2 kilograms at 10 weeks, and she stayed on flagell for 60 days before being clear. She's now 14 and a half years old. Is that, is that? Yeah, Giardia you're talking about. Giardia, I mean, it must be. She's not actually put in. Yeah, must be. Um, yes, uh, those, the you. smallest puppies are the strongest. <laughs> <laughs> They're uh, the real fighters. Yeah, from Kerry's, she said that she was told that steam cleaning kills Giardia. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. also uh, the Bunsenbrander, if you have the flame, yeah. But you can't flame the house or uh... <laughs> you can't flame through your dogs. <laughs> I can just see the steam cleaning my lawn. <laughs> uh, from Audrey, thank you so much for a wonderful webinar. When choosing a stud dog to mate with your maiden bitch during these COVID times, what's your what is your advice if you don't personally know the dog and you haven't seen him in the flesh, but everything else looks good on paper? Talk to other people that have used him. Absolutely. Yeah. Or people yeah. that have seen him. And yeah. if you can, get videos of him, particularly on the move. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think it will be a problem because lots of stud dogs are now chosen by Facebook pictures. Yeah. And we need to get some more info before we use him. Absolutely. For Marikel, with regards to atopy, would inflamed ears stop you from breeding with the dog? No other symptoms. Mm. Sorry? Inflamed no. ears. No, but if you see 10 months out of 12 months inflamed ears, yes, I would. Then yeah. for me, that's atopy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, usually, it's quite often the first sign of atopy. It starts off with the ears, and then as the dog gets older, it spreads, and you get the um, in the armpits and in the groin and uh, under the tail. Also, the hot spots. Uh, we see lots of goldens with hot spots. And that's also a sign of atopy. Not if you have one hotspot once a year, but some dogs really have very regularly in a year some hotspots. Well, I can tell you that since they brought out all these isoxos, like zolines or whatever they're called, um, I now ask them they've had next guard because I've seen several golden retrievers come up in skin issues having had uh, a next guard tablet. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the data sheet, it says. It doesn't say it for Brevector and it doesn't say it for Symparica, but it does say it for Nexgard that it can cause pruritus. Yeah. Okay. And it seems to me that Goldens may be, maybe because Goldens are so prone to allergies, um, that they seem to be the ones that come up. I have one of my own dogs did it and she, she is not atopic. Um, and she had about 10 spots come up three days after she had an Nexgard tablet. Yeah. yeah. I don't use those anymore. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very conscious about time because we've been um, we've been talking for quite a long time, and I haven't <laughs> mentioned all the many many people that have um, typed into the chat um, 
their thanks and appreciation of our specialist speakers tonight. I think everybody has so enjoyed listening to the three of you, your expertise, your depth of knowledge, and the different perspectives to, the different to our talk tonight. And, um, and um, I can't say how much say how much you giving you time to this. And I'm and sure I'm that sure that you'll be having lots be of having lots of laughs in other ways over the next few weeks. So um, thank you all once again, and thanks everybody for checking in this evening. And again, thank you, Anna. Um, and uh, I think that's that's uh, that's us over. And hope to see you next time. We've got a few things up our sleeves um, for planning for the end of the month or um, April. April. So uh, we hope that some of you will be able to join us again then. So thanks once again. And um, thank you, Fiona, Anne, and Natalie. We so appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank yeah. you for having us. We've enjoyed it. And I'm glad the people enjoyed it as well. Oh, they have really, honestly, Anne. And this, this forum, you know, to be able to see people that we would normally see at shows or meetings and have a little chat to and things, it's, it's, I think it's been so helpful during uh, the, the terrible long lockdown that we've had in the UK. You know, many, many people have been very appreciative of the um, of getting together like this, you know, and uh, I hope that um, they'll carry on enjoying what we've been doing. So, so thank you all very much. Thanks, Penny. Okay. You're most welcome. Have a really good uh, weekend, uh, what's left right. of it, and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.